Welcome back to Wide World of Sports. Now for the words we've all been waiting to hear. Here's Nissan Australia's Chief Executive, Ivan Deveson. Welcome to Eastern Creek and the Nissan 500. Gentlemen, start your engines. History is about to be made at Eastern Creek, the first major car race ever. And in front, in pole position, Jim Richards in the Nissan Skyline GTR. That's him on the right in the red, white and blue car. It's Larry Perkins completing the front rank, the two cars, and he is on the left in the white Holden. And then behind him, there are one, two, three, four, five, Ford Sierra Cosworths. So we've got all the varieties up at the front. It's going to be a long, long race. Three and a half hours or 125 laps, whichever is the shorter. And my guess is that it will be 125 laps. Weather conditions just about perfect. There's a stiff breeze blowing straight down the long 11 seconds flat out straight from turn 12 to turn one past the grandstand and it's going to be very demanding indeed on tires to put it mildly we're expecting at least one stop possibly two from several of the cars and jim richards has got an advantage in many ways he has four-wheel drive on his nissan and that's the only car with that in the race larry perkins the rear wheel drive v8 holden and there is the proud ranking of cars a lot of Ford Sierras in fact there are 11 Holdens that's the most and there's 10 Sierras three Nissans only one of them the GTR of Jim Richards and then the single Toyota and now they're rolling and it is from here the very fast finish of the straight into turn one and Alan Jones what do you think of it all well, Murray, it's fantastic to see a new uh, asset like this uh, being officially opened and to, first, to see the first race on it for Group A touring cars. It's going to be a little bit of a funny one today because uh, a lot of the guys have done their setup and homework based on the circuit as we knew it yesterday and the day before. Of course, we had that torrential downpour late yesterday afternoon and that's washed all the rubber and oil off the circuit. So really, they all have to start from scratch again and all the homework that's been done vis-a-vis -vis the tyres has all been changed. So we probably will see quite a few unscheduled pit stops because of that. Uh, I know that uh, when we went out in the morning warm-up this morning, it was very much slipperier than what it was yesterday and the day before. Uh, some tyres, I know our Yokohamas, they like a, a, an oil and rubber build-up, and of course that's disappeared now, so uh, it's going to be very interesting. So, so, here's the grid, Jim Richards in pole position, then Larry Perkins. Tony Longhurst is taking the first stint, of course, because Alan is with me right now. David Brabham is the Brabham brother, who is going to be in their Ford Sierra Cosworth first and so on for the rest of the grid. And of course, there are, as usual, three categories of car in the race. The Divisions 1, the big ones, Division 2 for 1,601 to 3,000 cc, and Division 3 for the Corollas that you are looking at now, that is up to 1,600 cc. There's going to be a lot of lapping here. The big cars are going to be on the small ones very quickly indeed. Is that going to be a problem, Alan? Unfortunately, it is here, Murray, because we have a lot of constant radius corners following constant radius corners following constant radius corners. Now, the best way to describe this, of course, is you see, if you go into a constant radius corner like we're looking at now, that can be a four or five second corner. Now, if you're stuck behind a car that's taking six seconds to go through that corner and you take five, you've only got to come across three corners like that and you've dropped three seconds in the lap. It's a very difficult circuit to pass on because there is only one optimum line and if the slow car is on that optimum line, you have to go around it's outside and of course as the race progresses that means the marbles will be out there making it virtually impossible to do that so you're virtually stuck behind the car until you come out of the corner and that of course is very bad news but the good news is that you can see the lead cars Richards on the right in the Nissan Larry Perkins on the left and his co-driver Thomas Mezera the man who started in Czechoslovakia and has gone on to win Bathurst 
Now, behind, on the left, Larry Perkins is Glenn Seaton in the Blue Sierra. Behind Richards is Tony Longhurst, who's co-driving with Alan Jones in the Yellow Sierra. And it's going to be a, a, a fast drag down to this first corner. There's, there are places you can pass here at the Eastern Creek Raceway, but needless to say, the first man in the first corner is going to have an advantage. And this is where the Nissan, if Jim can get the boost up, should be in good shape because all the power is going through to four wheels, front and rear. And they're waiting at the front in first gear. This is the worrying moment for the drivers because they don't want to be sitting there too long in first gear with the clutch down. I'm looking at the back of the grid as I talk to you and the last cars are coming up into position now. Any second now, it's going to be the start of the Nissan 500. Long, long race. Engine revs rising and it's go. And a super start by Jim Richards. Not quite so good by Larry Perkins. Richards leads into turn one, and it looks like Tony Longhurst up into second position on the left-hander. Actually, Brocky's done a fantastic start. He's come through into second place. Tony did a really good initial start, then he bogged it down a bit, but no one's going to keep up with that four. Oh, it's a daisy. Jim throwing it around. Tony in third, Brocky into second. Larry falling back into fourth place. So the battle is on now. Jim Richards, there he is, versus Peter Brock. Peter Brock's had his problems in practice, but he seems to have overcome them. He's having a little bit of problem with tyres here at this particular circuit. He's been trying to find a proper compound setup, and uh, I really don't know whether he's found it or not. I honestly expect Peter Brock to be one of the first in for tyres, to be honest. OK, well, now let's watch Jim Richards in the Nissan, otherwise known as Godzilla. Some 640 horsepower in qualifying trim. The four-wheel drive I told you about and twin turbos and Jim certainly knows as the reigning Australian champion how to use all that performance. Three victories in the series this year and he's out in front where he intends to stay. Coming up towards the end of the first lap, in fact they're in turn 11 now in this turn 12 circuit and there's Peter Brock and Tony Lo and nearly going off and going off. Peter Brock going off and spins right out. That's it. Now he will regain the circuit. I'm quite sure of that because it should be plenty of grip there. But that was a really bad one by Peter Brock. Yeah, I think Peter had a bit of brain fade there because he was on the outside of Tony. And I think instead of relenting a little bit and giving Tony way, he tried to keep his boot into it and uh, forced the position and uh, went off because of that. He put himself... It is very, very dusty offline. The minute you get offline, you get a lot of that dust from the rain that we had. And, of course, Peter found himself in that and you saw the consequences. Yeah, so now he's got to do it. Here's a replay. You see Brock, he slides sideways. He goes over the rumble strip. He's now got thoroughly out of kilter onto the grass, and there's no grip there. It's all friction and mud, and he's out. Mind you, I think he did a very good job not to come back and hit Tony, thank goodness. Yes. No, when I say he's out, I don't mean he's out of the race. I mean he's out of the corner. But he's well, well down, and it's lucky for him as into the pits comes the first caller. It's Gary Wilmington in the Toyota Supra. But now, Tony Longhurst in the yellow Sierra, dogged by Larry Perkins in the Holden, is in second position. So it's three different makes of car in the first three places in the opening stages of the Nissan 500. There is Tony Longhurst. Behind him, Larry Perkins. Behind him is Dick Johnson. So Dick's already proving to be a bit of a threat. Actually, Murray, it's uh, John Bow. It's uh, quite unusual that uh, uh, Dick's allowing uh, John to start the race. Normally, Dick does start the race, but uh, he's allowed John to start uh, for reasons uh, obviously best known to themselves. And Larry, of course, isn't enjoying the sort of horsepower that he did in practice. And to, to, to Larry's credit, he actually changed engines and went two down in the diff ratio to qualify. And that's a great effort to get the car in the front row because he had an engine in the car that was revving to 8,400 revs and he actually put two diff ratios lower uh, and he had to change all of that for the race. And just uh, for the record, as we are at the moment, it's Glenn Seaton who is behind John Bow. So, Nissan leads, Ford Sierra second, the Holden V8 in third position, a very confident Larry Perkins, incidentally, he was confident yesterday of being on the front row of the grid and he got there thanks to the special 
Holden V8 qualifying screamer that Alan was just telling you about. And he's got the good car for this circuit. It's sturdy, it handles well, it'll go the distance, shouldn't be too rough on tyres. What do you think, Alan? Well, you're quite right. It's a, it's a Commodore-friendly cir uh, circuit. Even without his qualifying engine, he's doing pretty good. But the, the thing with these long corners is that when you're on the turbo, uh, when you have to come off the turbo into these corners, you get turbo lag. And then when, when you go back on the accelerator, you haven't got anything for a split second. The Holden being normally aspirated, he can really use that throttle control to his advantage on these long corners where you see them going through there. And, of course, that is going to help tyre wear. And it's going to be a tyre race... Bridgestone, Yokohama and Dunlop, they're all on these cars. So Tony Longhurst second, number 11, Larry Perkins in third position. And we are on lap three in what we expect to be a wonder as, as through inside Longhurst up into second place goes Larry Perkins. Now I'll give you the gap as Richards goes past me. He's a good five seconds ahead of Larry Perkins. John Bow just takes Tony Longhurst. Oh, my goodness me, that was quite close. He had a go. Tony stuck to his guns. No, in fact, I'll, I think Glenn Seaton's going to get through now. What happened was John Bow forced the issue, kept Tony out wide. Seaton took advantage of that and just ducked in there as well. So Tony's gone from second back to fifth. Well, that's a couple of unexpected moves. Peter Brockwell down the field. Tony Longhurst down to fifth position. And although it's a long, long race, obviously, the bigger cushion you can build between yourself and the competition, and particularly before you start lapping people with the problem that Alan was talking about, where you can lose time and distance passing a slower man because of the constant radius curve, the better. That's John Bow. Behind him, Glenn Seaton. Then Tony Longhurst. And you can see now the configuration of this superb Eastern Creek Raceway. In open country, it's got just about every kind of corner, two hairpin bends, a very fast straight, a lot of sweepers, and something that most circuits these days, man-made ones, lack, and that is gradient. So, Perkins, you just saw him in second position, here's Bauer. I think uh, Tony Longhurst might be in a bit of problem. I, I hope to God he isn't, but he seems to be dropping back uh, considerably. Very early stages for this nonsense to be going on. Yes, he has. You see, he's dropping right back. I, he said he was going to conserve the tyres and look after the car, but that's being ridiculous. Well, it would be nice to have you up here for longer, Alan, but I sincerely hope we do. Well, by the look of this, Murray, I might be up here for all day. Now, here we are. Jump out. And we'll look at the gap between Jim Richards, race leader, and Tony Longhurst has definitely got a problem. They're streaming past the Sierra now. He's down to about 12th position as I talk to you. As you look at John Bauer, who... Now, here's a race order. It's Richards leading. Larry Perkins in second position. John Bauer is in third place. In fourth place, it is Glenn Seaton. In fifth place, it's Mark Gibbs. And we just wait for the sixth place man to go through now. It's George Fury. And there's Jim Richards. Now, just watch the stance and the steadiness of the Nissan GTR. Beautiful lines that car's got. As Jim Richards very confidently handles it, he knows exactly what this car will do, and he's doing it with safety. Second car into the pits already. Kenny Matthews and the Sierra has just pulled in, so he's obviously got some problems as well. Uh, in our car, the Benson and Hedges car, I know that we've had a few problems all weekend with the car. It's been cutting out. We've had some electrical problems. We just simply haven't been able to find it. We thought we had it all sorted out this morning's warm-up, but it looks like it may have reappeared. Now, as you watch the Nissan, uh, most people here think that if it keeps going, and we're with Jim Richards now, let's see uh, how he's going as we look through the windscreen with him, it looks totally relaxed. I was saying, there are people here who say there's no doubt about the fact that it will win, provided it goes the distance. And that is the question. It didn't go the distance at Bathurst. It's a long, long race here. It's a very complicated motor car with its four-wheel drive and all the other accessories that it has on it, an enormous load on the electrical system. 
but Jim Richards has no problems at the present moment. He's easing away from the opposition, building up that cushion that he needs. Maybe he will be coming in for a tar stop later, but it, but it won't be for some time. We expect him in about lap 55. By the way he's going, Murray, I think the lead that he's enjoying, even by lap five, I think he's going to be able to build up a really good cushion for himself and just, uh, and just drive the car about eight tenths by the way he's going. And he's going well, but it's time for a quick break from Eastern Creek. Be back soon. in the background in a moment there it is you see Larry Perkins in the Holden the gap is only about six seconds after seven laps so on average Richards has pulled away one second a lap but it's early days yet and significantly all the leaders are now having closed on and are having to pass the tail enders now here's an example coming up in front of us down into turn one the very very fast left hander goes Richard you see the pit lane on the right there in third position is John Bow in the Ford Sierra in fourth position is Glenn Seaton fifth behind him it is Mark Gibbs in the Commodore there is John Bow the Australian champion of 1985 and he's got he's hadn't got a battle on his hands there he was lapping one of the BMWs and he's right up now with the Holden you can see the battle between Larry Perkins in second place in the all-white Holden and in the Red Sierra John Bow with six seconds ahead of them Jim Richards at nine what do you think of the show so far Alan? Well, it's good, Mary. I think it's very early days. I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see who's just going to have to... Now, it looks like Larry's tyres are starting to go off a bit because he did actually pull away from Bow uh, quite comfortably, and now John's catching him up. So, you know, whilst the, the Holden has got the advantage of that throttle control being a normally aspirated engine, it is a lot heavier car, and therefore it's going to abuse its tyres a lot more. So uh, it looks like the tyres on the car are starting to go off slightly, and Bow is making some progress on him. Larry Perkins, 40 years old. You have to be very fit in this business. And, uh, and Larry lights up the headlamps, and that is to say, I'm bearing down on you in the Holden. You can see my lights in your rear view mirror. Move over and let me through. And he does so, and he lets John Bow through at the same time. And it was the full Radcliffe Toyota Corolla that's moved over. And you can see now, Bow is going through and up into second place, straight through, or is he? because he's got the inside line now on turn one. John Bow moves up into second position on lap 10. Down to third goes Larry Perkins. It's still Jim Richards in the lead. It's still Glenn Seaton in fourth position. Fifth is still Mark Gibbs, and in sixth place to complete the leaderboard, it is George Fury. As you see, just about one twelfth race distance. Temperature in the cockpit, Alan. You, I, I went out with Dick Johnson for three laps, and we did the fastest two up at Eastern Creek, 1 minute 39.4, and I was very hot and bothered just sitting in the passenger seat after three laps. Well, they are, they're like little mobile sauna baths. You know, you've got the hot turbo, uh, you've got the exhaust coming along underneath the floor plan, uh, floor pan, and uh, every, all that heat just gets into the uh, cockpit with you, and it doesn't disperse out very well at all. It's very hard to get the heat out of the car. So all the heat from the turbo, the engine, and the exhaust comes inside the car, and it is after about five or six laps. It's literally like sitting in a sauna bath. Well, that's one way to lose weight. Larry Perkins, of course, doesn't really need to lose it. He's quite a sparse chap at the best of times, and John Bow the same. That's the battle for second place that you see in front of you. So, in a situation where victory here at Eastern Creek is going to be magnificent publicity for whoever the manufacturer is that wins it, we've got a very interesting situation at the moment as into the finishing straight on the conclusion of lap 10, 
comes John Bow, so it's Ford second, Nissan leading, Holden in third position, another Ford in fourth place, that of Glenn Seaton, ten of them in the race. I wonder how many Fords and how many Holdens will finish, because this is most certainly going to be a race of attrition. If you finish here at the end of three and a half hours, you will have done well. Oh, too right. That's all Tony could speak about yesterday was, you know, Jonesy, we've got to finish tomorrow, we've got to bring it home. I'm totally confused as to what's happened to him, though, because he seems now to be going all right again. He's doing lap times in the 41s. Brabham's have just done a 41.3. Uh, Tony will be coming through shortly, and he's doing sort of high 40s and low 41s. So I don't really know what slowed him down there for those three or four laps, but it certainly cost him a heap of places. And Peter Brock is only 15th at the present moment, having spun off earlier in the race from well up in the order. In fact, he was in uh, fourth or fifth position, and down he went off the circuit, temporarily out of the race, at a standstill, had to rejoin the circuit. Now he's battling his way up through the field. But he has, of course, Excuse me, he has of course got plenty of time to make a recovery. Seaton's very, very slowly uh, eating away at uh, Larry Perkins as well. Now that John Bow has got past him, uh, Seaton's probably nibbling away at about three or four tenths every lap, so I think it won't be too long before we see him right up behind Larry. There are Bow and Perkins, and in the pits, Charles Stewart. Thanks, Murray. Well, uh, what's confusing you about what's happening to Tony Longhurst is also confusing their team manager. I had a very quick word with their, with Frank Gardner, and he just said, if I knew what was wrong, I'd fix it. So he doesn't know either. The ever laconic Frank Gardner, one of the most popular Australians ever to visit British shores, I can tell you, and he does a great job here too. So if Frank is mystified, it must be a real puzzle, and it's no consolation, of course, when you don't know what the problem is, because as Frank has just said, if he knew what the problem was, he would fix it. John Bauer doesn't seem to have one, still in second position. And if you, Alan, were in the lead position, with about a six second lead, what would be your tactics this early in the race? We're just about one-tenth distance. You see, lap 12 out of 120-odd. Well, I know that Jim has very good contact with the pits. Uh, I would know that I'm enjoying a second-a-lap advantage over my competitors. What I would be doing now, I'd be easing off slightly and just maintaining that gap. And if they look like closing up on me a little bit, I'd use the advantage that I had just to, just to get away a bit. But I'm sure that's exactly what's going on. He'll be in touch with Fred Gibson in the pits. Fred will be keeping him in touch as to uh, who's behind him, whether he's getting away from them or whether they're catching him. And I'm sure now what he'll probably do is drive in a manner just to save that car the best possible way he can. Look after the tyres, look after the gearbox, look after everything. Just maintain that very nice little advantage that he's very, very so well got. Jim Richards, well, he won the 1990 championship at Oran Park. Having already won at Winton and at Amaru this year, he's won in two different types of Nissan. But this is the one. Godzilla because the Japanese uh, using the enormous budget that Nissan have and their very considerable ability have maximized the advantage of four-wheel drive there's a, there is some contention I would imagine about whether four-wheel drive should be allowed in view of the fact that it costs so much well that's the only reason I mean I don't believe in uh penalizing a manufacturer simply because he comes out with a wonderful car that can beat everybody else so good luck to them that's what it's all about but the main consideration of course is the cost factor because it, if it means that other people have to go four-wheel drive and turbo and so forth and so on it's going to make it terribly prohibitive cost-wise for other competitors and i think for that reason only uh, i would like to see them perhaps go back to two-wheel drive normally aspirated i mean formula one even have to had to get rid of the turbos because of the escalation in costs Jim Richards coming up to lap the Toyota Supra, which has already been in the pits. Time for a break from Eastern Creek. Jim Richards, the Australian champion, number one appropriately there in the Nissan 
He's making it look very easy indeed here at Eastern Creek. He is now leading John Bow by nearly 10 seconds with Larry Perkins just one second behind John Bow. Now, in the situation that we're in now, you watch the cars very carefully for any signs of a problem. And I notice, Alan, that particularly on the, on the downshift, Jim Richards there is getting a big puff of smoke. Now, would that be something in your view to do with the turbo or nothing? I don't think it's anything to worry about at this stage. It has been blowing a little bit of smoke from the word go, but I know what you mean. On a couple of corners there, I did notice it perhaps blowing a bit more than what it had done previously. Uh, now, whether it's leaning itself off a bit because of the change in weather, and of course, you know, being turbos, they well within their reach to do that. I mean, uh, I know that our car, depending on the weather conditions, you physically have to richen it up or lean it up. So it may have just leaned itself off a bit because of the, we have a very changing weather pattern here today. That may be a contributing factor. Right, you're looking at John Bow in second place. Ahead of him is Jim Richards in the lead. Behind there, third position, is the Holden of Larry Perkins. Then it's Glenn Seaton who is in fourth position. Quite a long gap then. In fifth place, George Fury is the man. And in sixth place, pretty close to George Fury, is Mark Gibbs in the Commodore. And then in seventh position, it's a long, long race, Charlie O'Brien, who is doing the first stint in his Sierra. So no real reliability problems amongst the men at the front so far. Yes, we've had the Toyota come in. Yes, we have seen Tony Longhurst drop back, but he's going well now. Yes, we have seen Peter Brock go off in the very early stages, but Brocky, incidentally, is fighting his way up the field. He is now in 10th position in a situation where he joined and rejoined about 20th. But of course, he would be having to push very hard and possibly straining his tires. Well, that is always the problem in the effort to get back up there amongst the leaders. He might have to push a little bit harder than what he'd normally like to earlier in this stage of the race, and the tyres will take its toll on that. It's interesting to see that David Brabham's going very well. He's lapping consistently in the low 41s, which I believe if he can continues to do that, that could very well win the race. And Kevin Waldock's going very well. I see Brocky's having a few problems trying to get past him. I mean that in a nice way, not a, not a bad way. <laughs> and uh, David's brother, Gary, who is driving as his co-driver here at Eastern Creek in the Sierra, has announced this morning that next year he is forsaking Europe and Britain to our great regret and going to America to drive one of the very powerful Nissans in the same category as his brother, Jim. So, we are now on lap 17 out of 125, and welcome, Darrell Eastlake. Thank you, Murray. Yes, a very exciting race so far, as you said, a fighting drive so far from Peter Brock. Went off in 20th positions, worked his way back up to 10th, and I think he's really starting to enjoy this. He likes to press on, he loves to drive hard, whether the car will hold together, but that tyre problem he was anticipating seems to be non-existent at the moment, because the car is really, really on the pace. Looking at the Glen Seaton uh, Sierra, been going very well of late, starting to get this car into a uh, song at the end of the season, which augurs well for next year. Been a great uh, start from Glen Seaton, a big job to form his own team, get everything up and running, but the car starting to look pretty competitive uh, in the latter start of this season. Well, Wynn Percy joins us on Channel 9's Wild of Sports to cover the Nissan 500. Win your impressions so far. Well, I guess it's going like uh, a 500k race should go. Um, people are fanning out a little bit, which is only natural. The Nissan certainly showing its pace here this afternoon. Um, but with Laurie and uh, John Bay very close together, it's certainly interesting for second at the moment. Just talking about Glenn Seaton, I mean, you know how hard it is to organise and run a team. You do that for uh, Holden Racing here in Australia. But Glenn Seaton's had to buy cars, set them up, sort them out, have all the responsibilities of chasing sponsorship and now starting to come good what it feels like <laughs> yes he's doing very very well the presentation of the car is excellent he's had some good results especially the latter half of the year um, you get to a point where you just start wondering what you want out of life whether you want to be 100 percent driver or or a preparer and a manager uh, when the driving's going well you know darn well what you want when the managing's going well you know darn well what you want to put it together is not easy very difficult job indeed 
but some good backup talent there with George Fury, a very steady driver, a very heady driver, and very consistent, and can run with the same sort of times as Seaton, which is important. Well, what's interesting with George is the fact that the man was out for most of this year. He immediately got in a car, and I would imagine within five laps, he was doing very impressive times. About Peter Brock charging back through the field, I think sometimes that's the situation that Peter enjoys. He wouldn't have enjoyed going off the circuit, but he does like to, to fight in his driving. He does like to come through the pack, and if the car will hold together, it could be a very interesting drive indeed. A race like this, Darrell, is, is an awful lot about incentive, and if you're out there, sometimes it's very difficult to keep the adrenaline going, whether you be winning or, or losing or whatever, just to keep going against the pit board. What the man is doing now is, is getting one car at a time, getting back up to the front. He's got a hell of a challenge on his hands, but it does make it very exciting. Well, he went off in 20th spot or he joined, rejoined the race in 20th spot. He's now in ninth position, Peter Brock, in 05, so uh, a marvellous, marvellous effort so far. Blasting down the main straight here as Murray Walker set 11 seconds of flat out speed around about uh, 280 kilometres an hour at the end of the straight, which is roughly about, uh, what, 170 mile an hour, so they're not hanging about. No, they're certainly not. Interestingly, this first corner seems to be holding up very well. I'm watching the tyres to see if people start getting sideways here, but they're not. The cars look stable. I thought earlier on Larry Perkins was having a rear tyre problem, but it seems to be OK. Well, when we think about it, uh, about lap 40, we're expecting them to come into the pits for the first of the tyre changes, and also the brake pads will have to be changed. And Larry Perkins has told me that he thought he would change the pads on the first change. Everybody else seems to want to change on the second. The other interesting point about the pit stops is that the Nissan will take a lot longer to change pads, so that advantage they really do need to build up. Sure, it looks as if the Nissan, the way it runs because of its uh, configuration, does need to change the rear pads as well as the front. Looking at Peter Brock now, the mobile Sierra, incredible driver for so many years in this country, really a, a folk hero. He's uh, now up into ninth position, rejoined the race after a spin in the opening laps at 20th position, so a fighting drive again from Brock, and the fans really love to see him this way. Welcome back to Eastern Creek. You're looking at Jim Richards in the GTR Nissan leading this event by around 14 seconds from John Bow and the Ford Sierra of Dick Johnson's. But the big story of the race at the moment, Peter Brock just going past the sixth sister car of, uh, of number six. That's his other Sierra. Now moving into seventh place at around about 54 seconds behind Jim Richards, that man who is leading the race. So, Brock charging through the pack. Tony Longhurst, unfortunately, the yellow Sierra has back into 15th position. Well, win. it really is a great story of this race. Can Brock whittle away? Jim Richards doing it easy out in front at the moment, but Brock charging and charging hard. I think it's very difficult to close the gap with, uh, with uh, Jim. It's all he's doing, really, is going back up through the field. Um, but the initial gap, the, the gap that was created when he went off early, I don't really see him closing it at the moment. Peter Brock charging away here at Eastern Creek in the first official car race of the circuit. 51.17 that time down to now Peter Brock. So whittling away from 54 down to 51.17, really charging away. Now, Peter was very concerned about tyres. He had all of those problems at Bathurst we all know about, but he figured he'd got the configuration of the compound right here, running very hard rubber. The trouble is here, um, with the rain they had yesterday, it was such a violent storm, it's probably washed the track clear. So the warm-up this morning would have uh, given a fair bit of insight into what they had to do. And I noticed on Peter's tyres, they drilled a series of holes across the, the width of the tyre to try and let out some of the temperature to, to stop the hot spots. One of the things he said to me, because the track is changing daily because of the weather, there's too much grip on the track in places and the car's understeering badly. We've got we the Nissan coming into the pits and there's a big problem. Flat tyre by the look of the wheel is off. 
The wheel is chasing Jim Richards down pit lane at the moment. There's the wheel chasing Jimmy Richards down into the pits. Well, this is just the sort of thing that's happened to this Nissan GTR since it's made its a big debut at Bathurst. Problems, he's driving it on three wheels. Watch this, a very, very critical stop now. Jimmy Richards into the pits. Mark Scaife over there saying what went wrong. We can see what went wrong. The wheel came off. Now, how much damage would that cause to the hub and the disc? Well, I'm sure, Darrell, that uh, it's ground the bottom of the disc away. It is, obviously, we're all interested. We can't see from here exactly the problem. To my amazement, they just seem to be fitting a wheel back on. It doesn't seem to be too much panic in the stop. They've had a look. The wheel came straight out underneath now having a look at the car. Now this will make this race most interesting indeed. This very, very potent motor car sitting in the pits, going out now. Well, that's amazing. I mean, very little work other than just sitting in. Rock's number two car coming into the pits also, but the Nissan going back out after really just a routine change of wheel. Well, that does surprise me. What does surprise me, if it was just a routine wheel, um, a loss of a wheel, no other damage, is to why on earth they didn't change all the other tires after this length of time and top up the fuel tank. Well, when the tyre came off, Jim was obviously coming into the pits. He yes. committed himself for that, and the wheels just come off as he came in. Well, uh, Jim is a very experienced driver. Even if the wheel was still fairly firm, any vibration going through the car, he would have acknowledged and started to come in. Well, Jimmy Richards, you're looking at him now, coming out after that amazing stop to fit a new wheel after the wheel coming off as he went into pit lane. Richards has rejoined in 12th position. Now, Win Percy, what can we expect the damage to uh, to show out of that accident. I mean, there's Jimmy now. We're looking at him at work. He never shows any emotion, this bloke. He's cool as ice. But surely there must be some things going through his mind. This is the sort of uh, confidence you must have in your, your team for someone to come in in this situation, put a wheel on and go again. You accept the fact they've looked at the car. You accept the fact there is no damage visibly. You've then got to have the confidence to go straight back on the track and get on with it. As I said a few moments ago, I'm surprised that they didn't make use of that stop to top up with fuel and replace all the tyres and then give the car a chance, possibly, of, of one stop less later in the race. Well, there's no doubting Nissan's unfortunate luck since debuting this car at Bathurst. It ran so well, finally broke and was out of contention. Mark Scaife virtually wrote another of the cars off, the second of the team cars, in the Adelaide Grand Prix last weekend, which all of Australia saw in such spectacular fashion. And now this happening at Eastern Creek. I mean, it's just an amazing run of bad luck. Well, that is incredible, to actually lose a wheel. Um, races are lost by, by such uh, silly mistakes, I'm afraid. Well, our man in the pitch, Charles Stewart, brings us up today, Charles. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, Mark's case with me. He's just been looking at the tyre. Mark, what on earth happened? Actually, well, the, the tyres in the car, Charles, are still fine. What we decided to do was come in a little earlier so that we were going to have to make one full stop and a half stop. So we've done our half stop now, and we'll do one full stop later in the race, and then I'll get in the car. So Jimmy's done one and a half sort of stints. But he came in without one front wheel. How exactly, did that occur? exactly right. I'm not sure what's happened there yet, but we'll go and have a look at that now. I've been speaking to the guys. Fairly worrying. Well, the tyres are fine. The left hand side wheel coming off is fairly worrying, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Mark Scaife, the man we we're talking about involved in that horrendous accident with the Nissan GTR at the Adelaide Grand Prix and very lucky to get out of that unscathed. It was a nasty, nasty accident. It certainly was. I nearly had one myself at the same corner later in the Grand Prix weekend. It's a picture to watch Jim at work, you know. You watch him place the car. It's so precise. The man looks as if he's relaxed. He makes it all look so very easy, and I can assure you it's not. Not even in that, uh, I would imagine, very, very nice motor car to drive with its four-wheel traction. It's still a lot of hard work. Well, it's a very interesting situation because Fred Gibson was talking to Mark Scaife, and obviously he's a, a youngster with a lot of talent, but he said, you don't see Jimmy Richards bouncing off curbs, and you don't see Jimmy Richards getting sideways. He said, once you learn to drive as refined and as precise as Jim Richards, then you're going to be a complete driver. Yeah, you're right there. I mean, Jim is world-class driver. Uh, he's been noticed all around the world, and I, I imagine that's why Freddie's obviously picked him up and made him number one driver. OK, we're still looking at this battle as uh, we're waiting for the leaders to come back onto the straight. Johnny Bow leading Larry Perkins, and there's not much on it. They should come past the uh, start-finish line any moment now. We'll give you a gap on that as they come past us, because you're still riding with Jimmy Richards. 
waiting for the leaders to blast past us down this long straight around the 280 kilometres an hour, about 160, 170 mile an hour. There they are, there's the gap between first and second. So Larry Perkins holding on well, of course. Murray tipped, Murray Walker tipped a, a hold and win. And Wynn Percy, you're pretty confident they'll go the distance. And he's hanging on like a, a, a Shearer's dog with a bone at the moment. Yeah, it does look good, doesn't it? The car looks stable. Uh, we've been here testing quite early on. What amazed us was the way that we can balance the normally aspirated engine around some of these corners. Whereas the turbo car, it's not as easy. You're cracking the turbo, you're cracking the throttle, and coming off then unbalances the car. The normally aspirated engine, you can just get a finer throttle balance. Larry Perkins was very confident in the pitch. as 1.4 seconds the difference between John Bow and the Johnson Sierra. And Larry Perkins in the privateer Holden that he carries his own name. And he said to me, yes, I'd do anything to get my name off the car. He said, I'd like somebody else's off because that means they're paying the bills. <laughs> the interesting thing about Larry Perkins as well is that he prepares so many engines for so many makes of cars here in Australia. Larry Perkins basically is an engineer. Of course, he did drive Formula One with a BRM team. You're looking at Johnny Bow there. Perkins in the white car behind but he prepares something like 90 V8 engines for racing right throughout the year. That's Perkins in the white uh, Commodore there. Also, he prepares the top four of the Formula Holden engines that completed that exciting series that we televised for you this year, plus many of the other competitors as well. But the one thing he said, you must have quality control, you must be able to prove that you can build the product. Well, he's been doing that of late and doing it in fine style. He certainly is. This is a, a fine example of two top quality drivers just getting on with a job, sitting in their office. That is such a quick corner around there, it's quite surprising. Heavy braking point, back into second gear, balancing the car on throttles. Well, there we go, Johnny Bow in the Dick Johnson Sierra, the shell car, the red car out in front of Larry Perkins in the white Commodore. An exciting battle going on here. A long way to go. Stay with us right around Australia. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Eastern Creek. You're looking for the battle between first and second, and Larry Perkins closes the gap again. In the Commodore, John Bow goes off in a big way. Round he goes, John Bow. So Larry Perkins and the Commodore take the lead. Bow just spinning the car. He's been pressured by Larry Perkins, lap after lap after lap, and finally lost it. Just spun around, and Larry Perkins now in the Commodore has taken the lead. Well, this crowd here has gone absolutely crazy. We saw a hold and win at Bathurst. Murray Walker tipped a win here for the Commodore, and now it's in front of Wynn Percy was confident too. But the Sierras, watch this again. Wynn Percy, talk us through this. Well, this is a rare mistake by John. Obviously, he was trying to cover himself. He was a little bit too tight into the corner. Tried to just get the apex right, locked up and spun. Larry's taking advantage. Larry, for two laps, has been really hounding him. There it is again. John Bow spinning out the shell. The Red Sierra of uh, Dick Johnson going out and Larry Perkins in front. Well, Larry would be absolutely delighted with this because it's been a forceful drive. He closed right up on the rear end of that Sierra you're looking at now and he pressured and pressured and pressured. And when he kept putting the nose in and saying, I'm here, don't forget that I'm here and it paid dividends. John certainly lost quite a lot of time in that spin, I'm afraid. Plus, it will take a good lap now to clean the tyres again. That gravel will bite into the hot rubber. And uh, what are we, 30 laps into the race now, so the tyres have had their best. They're still working well, but they've had their best. All right, as the cars head down the start-finish line again, it's Charles Stewart in the pits. What's happening there, Charles? Thanks, Harold. Well, Peter Brock has just come in a little bit earlier than you'd hope, Peter. Yeah, I was hoping for uh, lap 35. But uh, we're still on schedule, basically. It's uh, just tyre wear. And, uh, well, tyre's sort of having a bit of a, bit of a uh, blister in this hot temperature. Uh, but we're sort of half happy, considering the uh, start of the race. But I got pushed into all the, uh, all the muck on the side of the track, and uh, it's just like driving on marbles, actually, for a few seconds. Right, so how is, how is it out there at the moment? You've been making up a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, is that a position that you enjoy? Yeah, actually, a bit of incentive, a bit of a red flag or ball. Uh, basically, if you keep on line, do it nice and clean and accurate, you know, you're going to go well. And uh, 
it's it's going to be fantastic uh, races it wears on i'm sure of that and uh, to see larry perkins out in front is fantastic uh, good for racing thank you very much peter thanks Charles. back to you daryl thank you charles well that's brock's car back out on the circuit the great man you've heard what he said he got out on the marbles and lost the car but if you keep it nice clean and tidy then you can work your way back larry perkins at the moment plus six seconds in the lead win percy brock makes a lot of sense oh yes he does for sure it's, it's very difficult sometimes to give a car its best on its first lap before obviously the tires are working everything's correct and he just admits he got out on the marbles and he lost it so the mobile 05 what a famous racing number that is jim richards now back into sixth place remember when he came out of the pits after that astonishing situation of losing a wheel he was back in 12th he's now 40s way up six more places so this race changing all of the time very very exciting and a long way to go yet as i said that 05 number so famous right around australia Yes, back in uh, my home country of England, we used to see Bathurst on the TV long before we ever saw any touring car races in England or Europe. And Peter Brock and uh, the Ford Holden battle in Australia was the highlight of everything. Well, you've put a lot of zing back into that by uh, winning Bathurst this year. And what a stirring drive from you at last weekend's uh, Adelaide Grand Prix meeting, particularly on the Sunday race when you came from the rear of the grid to fight your way right up into the top three. That was an amazing race. That's the type of race a driver loved. You throw your brains out the window and go for it. It's really good. <laughs> We'd love to see you when you're brainless. <laughs> uh, locking up a wheel there now. Uh, the Brock car, as it works, gets its way back through the field. We're looking. Uh, he's back into 15th place now, the Brock car. So certainly not out of contention, but a lot of work to do. And obviously must be very careful with his afternoon's work, both drivers. That's right. You get to this stage of a 500k race, which is probably um, the races that I'm more used to than sprint races throughout the world. And uh, you get a situation where you've pitted early, you've had a problem, and you begin to wonder if there's any chance at all. You have to get, to get into your little brain then that the pit board's the, the, uh, the necessary thing. You have to go by your pit board to make yourself stay at a reasonable race pace. Although it may look as if things are a little bit down and the, the, the battle is lost, you just have to keep going. A long race like this, anything can happen. Well, when you were telling me yesterday that your, the basis of your whole racing career has been long-distance events, what sort of discipline do you have to apply to yourself over each of the laps that you do? I mean, do you talk to yourself? What goes through your mind? Well, it's uh, the Glenn Seaton cars in, 35. Seaton into the pits. Um, yes, it, it's, it's mind over matter, really. I mean, for instance, a 15-lap race at Adelaide Grand Prix last week probably takes as much out of you, out of you physically as a very long race because you give everything to it. A long race, you can actually achieve the same sort of speed or very close to it, but you tend to mentally calm down because you know that you're there for a long time. In the pits now, the seat in Sierra, looking at a, a routine change by the look of that. Perhaps because of this heat wind, cars are coming in a little earlier. Brock said that he had to, he was forced to come in a little earlier. We were expecting a few more laps, but that just looked like a routine stop to us. Yes, it did. I would imagine the tyres are suffering a little more after that wash track than they expected. It looks as if it's quite straightforward. The car's running strongly. We should explain to people all around Australia, yesterday we had an amazing thunderstorm here at Eastern Creek. Something like an inch and a half of rain fell within 45 minutes and the drivers were very happy with the circuit up the land because there'd been a lot of oil and rubber laid down on the committed racing line. That, of course, was washed out in the deluge that we suffered and that's the reason that Peter Brock is talking about his tyres blistering. That's the reason we've seen Seaton come in so early for tyres. Yeah, sure. With a new surface like this, one of the major contributing factors to, to a race of this length has got to be tyres. It's quite interesting walking around the pits today, talking to the boys this morning. A lot of them really don't know what to wear for the first stint. Well, a lot of the drivers that I've spoken to have gone for their Bathurst compounds. They figured that was about the right choice. Larry Perkins has done exactly that. He's been very, very happy with his choice of tyres. Peter Brock, of course, had to change his combination because it was so disastrous at Bathurst. But everybody else seems to think that the Bathurst rubber and running as hard a compound as you can uh, will make the difference. And so far, I guess that's working to plan, although this heat is now the determining factor. Well, because um, Bathurst was resurfaced prior to the race this year, um, Dunlop had a test day, and they came up with a new compound, a new a D15 compound, and I must admit it was a very major contributing factor to us winning Bathurst. LP, Larry Perkins, is running on that compound here today. He seemed quite confident it would do the job, and so far it's proving him correct.
after 36 laps, it's Larry Perkins from John Bow. Mark Gibbs in the GIO Commodore. Great, great drive from him so far up into third place. And Kevin Bartlett has been the mentor of that team. He's been coaching the young drivers and showing them what's been going on. So great job from them so far. Jimmy Richards fighting his way back through the pack like Peter Brock back into fourth. Remember, he rejoined after losing a wheel into sixth spot, came uh, into 12th spot, fought his way up to sixth spot, is now fourth. So the GTR suffering no ill effects of losing the wheel. Down in the pits, though, Charles Stewart. Yeah, thanks, Dale. I've got Alan Jones with me. Alan's about to get back into the other Sierra. Alan, uh, what have you heard about uh, what's going on? Well, we don't really know. We've had trouble all weekend with some uh, electrical problem. The car just literally cuts itself off. And I've been up on the pit counter, and he's passed a few times literally in what appears to be angel gear with the engine just dead. It may be the same old problem reoccurring. And uh, Frank Gardner's now suggested something that we make it a little bit easier for the uh, oil tank to breathe because it might be creating a bit of a, a pressure and putting too much load on the pump and therefore that affecting the whole electronics. If that's the case, we might leave Tony in to do one more stint because he at least is familiar with what's going on. Whereas if I jump in, I have to cope with, you know, learning how to drive the car with its problems. Now, what about your other car, the Brabham Boys? It's going really well. David's driving very consistently. He's up into eighth place. He's doing very consistent 40s, high 39s. And I think if he continues that, or if they can continue that, they're going to look real good at the end of the day. Hey, Jay, thank you very much. Good luck. Tony Longhurst grappling with some problems and will stay out for an extra stint. AJ will have to wait for his turn to get into the action. And this is another team that has suffered from some problems throughout the year. Win Percy. Yes, I think the, uh, the well, not the trouble, but the fact is that we're producing so much power from these Group A cars now. Everything is balancing on rather thin strips of rubber. Although all the tyre companies are developing tyres all the time, it really is an ongoing battle. Former Bathurst winner, and next year switching over to the B, uh, the BMW M3s, the two Schnitzer cars that are coming out to race in New Zealand at the Wellington Street Race. They will then be shipped over to Australia for Tony Longhurst and Alan Jones to convert into the yellow famous colours of their racing team. And that's a pretty bold move win when you think about it, because the M3 really wasn't competitive in Brock's hands towards the end of the last in here in Australia, but they're quite confident, may not be an outright winner, but if anybody makes a mistake, they'll be there. Yes, you're right. I think uh, you'd be surprised how quickly they're going to go. Under German regulations, as far as the performance is concerned, you're allowed to do an awful lot more uh, to the development of the engine. It's running at a very light weight as well. I would stake money on, uh, on the little M3 winning sprint races next year on certain circuits in Australia. Well, it's great to see another Mark being involved in the Australian Touring Car Championships, a bold move by Jones and Longhurst switching to the BMW M3s. And they are the German works car, so they really are work supported all the way. Oh, yes. Looking at the times that they're doing in Germany and uh, the rest of Europe, on based on times that we're used to with even our Jaguar, I really do think you'd be very surprised. And a great move, too, to get the Brabham boys, David and Gary, out here to drive. They haven't had much experience in touring cars, but they've really enjoyed their time driving around this particular circuit, learning the ropes, and they've been going pretty well, too. Yes, it's not an easy thing for uh, single-seaters, uh, even Formula One boys, to jump into a touring car. Uh, it might look easy, and you might think because it's not as fast that it's a natural progression, it's not a problem. That isn't the case at all. They find that they have to work harder in them, they're not specially designed motor cars for racing. They're adapted, and it's not that easy. Well, there's the leader, Larry Perkins. Really fantastic job. We're going to do a lap with Larry Perkins for you and just show you the sort of speeds and the sort of revs that he's pulling here at Eastern Creek. And this car has been a great success this year. He really has put a lot of work and development in it. Win, what's the difference between Larry's car and yours, the works Holden? Is there a lot of difference? No, very, very little. Uh, we tend to go down the same tracks. Um, maybe the setup of the car is slightly different. Performance is similar. Uh, no, it, it, the times are very similar, and it points to the fact that we're doing the same sort of things. We're progressing down the same track. It certainly lifted the game of the Holden in Australia this year with the good battle that we've had with the Perkins engineering car. OK, well, let's set it up now with Larry Perkins as he... Uh comes around for another lap here and he goes across the start finishing line now well when percy he will be pulling something like 248 kilometers an hour at the end of that straight 
going into this sweeper now in fifth gear, virtually flat out, coming out at around about 215. Yeah, back on the power, down to the second gear, almost hairpin back on yourself. Balancing the car, not trying so hard not to put too much of those back tires. He's into third and fourth now, sitting up at around four and a half thousand revs, will come back into third gear. Back into third gear, down through bo the bottom of the corner here, back on the throttle, balancing the whole car. Now he'll stay in third and just concentrate on lines through here. Again, desperately trying not to make those tires slide too much. Just trying not to get too much heat. It's a funny little kink here that you almost have to take the wrong line to make sure that you put the brakes on in a straight line. Otherwise, it's so easy to flat spot a tire and the whole stint is ruined, the whole race is ruined for you. Now he's getting an indication he can overtake on the inside. A nice, neat line through here. Again, concentrating on your tires. Down to heavy braking point. Back into second gear. Balancing the car, looking for the apex of the corner. Back on the throttle now, using every inch of the black stuff and a little bit of green and dusty stuff as well. And back up through into fourth gear. Another nasty little kink, so easy to flat spot tires here. Get the car back on balance in second gear. Gently through the corner and back on the power, squeeze it on, kiss the edge of the road because you want every inch of straight line speed you can make and away down the main straight again. And there you go, Larry Perkins, a lap with him. Wynn Percy doing the commentary, Larry Perkins doing the driving, the Holden doing the work and they're leading. We'll be back shortly. out in his car. Dick, how's everything going? So far, so good. I just uh, hope it keeps going like that. What is your race plan in this? Is everything going to that? Well, at this point in time, it is, yeah. John had a little bit of trouble early on. He locked up a brake and had a spin, but uh, other than that, everything's fine. Thank you, Dick. Good luck out there. Okay. And you are looking at race leader Larry Perkins, who has been in the pits for about 12 seconds. He was leading by 28 seconds when he came in, so he has still got some leeway before John Bow, who has spun off the course but rejoined, goes through. In fact, he's done so as I talk to you. John Bow leads. <laughs> Eastern Creek, it is all happening. Car number one, Jim Richards, is back in the lead because into the pits have come Mark Gibbs. Into the pits have come John Bow. Into the pits have come Larry Perkins. Now there is the changeover between John Bow and Dick Johnson in the yellow helmet. And his pit stop, the seconds are ticking away. You can see John Bow tightening up the seat belts of Dick Johnson. And all the time, of course, they're slipping down through the field. And Jim Richards, who came into the pits on lap 23 with the front left wheel missing, limped in on three corners and calmly got back into the race with a new left front wheel, is in the lead. And in second position, quite some way back behind Richards, it's Colin Bond, the man who has won two rounds of the Australian Touring Car Championship this year. Larry Perkins is in third position, having made his tyre stop, and there's news from Charles Stewart in the pits. Thank you, Harry. Well, we're with a very hot Larry Perkins. Larry, hot, but is it worthwhile out there for you today? Well, so far it is. Uh, all going along nicely. Certainly is hot, though. Uh, we had a comfortable little cushion when we made our uh, pit stop for fuel and pads, but We've only got one more scheduled yeah. stop, and that sh should be just for tyres, and that's quite a bit quicker. And uh, so far, you know, my times aren't deteriorating. Just got to press on and wear them down again. What about the car? You were saying earlier the alternator light's on. Is that a problem? No, we've got uh, uh, one one diode's dropped out, but we've still got plenty of charge here, so it's not a it's not a problem. You'll be there at the end. Well, we certainly hope so, but uh, one shouldn't make rash predictions in these long races. 
Thank you very much, Larry. Good luck. Back to you, Murray, in the commentary position. So, car number 11, the magnificent Holden V8, driven by the Czech-born Thomas Mazzera, who made his name in Formula Ford, Bathurst winner, of course, and Larry Perkins and Thomas make a tremendously strong combination behind that 520 horsepower engine. So, that is the race leader, and in second place now, it is Colin Bond in the Sierra, in third, third position. Well, there's race leader. Jim Richards leads. Then, in second position, Colin Bond. In third position, Thomas Metzera. And Thomas, of course, is benefiting from all the driving that Larry Perkins did. That's the second place car, and it is the car of Colin Bond, the man who won at Lakeside, the one man who won at uh, Malala. And those are his first wins for over 10 years. So 48-year-old Colin Bond, he's no youngster in racing terms, but he's got all that racing experience, is really back in the picture. In second place, ahead of Metzera in the Perkins Holden. In fourth position, it is Dick Johnson going hard, having taken over from John Bow. And in fifth position, it is Drew Price having taken over from George Fury, who has bought their Sierra in. Sixth position behind Fury, and we're waiting to go through now, is the Pearson Stewart Commodore, which is going extremely well. And let's run, do a recap on the pit situation. While you are watching, incidentally, the car in second place, that is the Sierra of Colin Bond. Now you're with Jim Richards, the race leader. He has kept cool as ever. Well, Richards, that we're riding with now, was first into the pits on lap 23 with that missing front wheel. Back in 12th position. Then Charlie O'Brien came into the pits. Then Peter Brock, who had gone off and rejoined 20th and fought his way through the field, came into the pits. And he was followed by Glenn Seaton on lap four. By the way, it's Andrew Medecki driving now, the Brock car. On lap 35, George Fury came in. Then on lap 43, Larry Perkins for a 45-second stop, from which Thomas Metzera rejoined in 11th position. Mark Gibbs, who was second at the time, came in on lap 46. And now, in this race, which is going to be 125 laps, or three and a half hours, whichever is the longer, and we're, we've got a long, long way to go because we are on lap 51, as you see, out of 125. Jim Richards, the New Zealander, 43 years old, started his career in carts, and he's coming up now to lap Gary Brabham, who is one of the two brothers, sons of Sir Jack, of course, and he is about to be lapped by Richards, and more news from Charles Stewart in the pits. Yes, thank you very much, Murray. We've got an update on the Tony Longhurst situation. Alan Jones, um, you've just been talking to Tony. What is the problem? Well, he doesn't seem to be able to rev the car much over about 6,000, and we normally rev it to about 7.4, so he's 1,400 revs down. And it seems to be a heat-related problem. As soon as the car gets hot, he, it's the worst it gets, and he, does, he can only change gear up to about 6. Now, we've just filled him up with fuel, send him back out and he's done a 38.6 which is about two seconds quicker than what he's done for the last 35 laps so whether it's a, a it's a heat related fuel thing or not we don't know so in the meantime you get to spend time here in the shade in the cool is that yeah, right yeah but i've got to stick around because he could, could be in any minute unfortunately all right thank you very much alan back to you Mary. and into the pits comes race leader jim richards there we are you can see the nissan pit crew working away and Jim Richards is about to hand over to 23-year-old Mark Scaife in the Nissan GTR. Mark, who took that dreadful crash at Adelaide, and as recently as two days ago, he wasn't sure about whether he was going to be able to drive here at Eastern Creek. But he's fit, he's happy, he practiced yesterday, he qualified well, and of course, they've lost the lead now because with the Nissan stationary in the pits on lap 52, up into the lead has gone the Glen Seaton Colin Bond Sierra. 
and in second position now it's Thomas Metzera in the Holden. In third position it's Dick Johnson who has of course taken over from John Bow. In fourth place it is the Drew Price George Fury car and there's Glenn, there is Mark Scaife sitting impassively in the cockpit. You've got to wait for the fuel to go in, you've got to wait for the tyres and wheels to be changed. And of course, at this stage of the race, this is the longest stop that the Nissan is likely to have because they are changing brake pads. And on the Nissan, that is a pretty complicated, long-winded operation. <coughs> so, and that, that, that gives the Ford Sierra of Glenn Seaton and Colin Bond the opportunity to pull ahead. Win Percy, you're the Holden man, and your Baker car is in second place with Thomas Mitzera driving. Are you going to have any brake pad problems, or rather are they? And well, hello, hello, off goes the Sierra. And as you can see, the it's, it's yeah. the Playscape car, and that is Kevin Waldock and Andrew Bagnall. It'll be Andrew Bagnall, I think, at the wheel, because Kevin started off their stint. He's gone off, he's rejoined perfectly safely. And just before you answer that question, when on lap 53, it is still the seat Bon Sierra in the lead. It is still in second place, Mitzera in the Commodore. Still in third position, it is Dick Johnson. And what's the brake pad answer with? Well, certainly with Larry Burton's car, they're hoping to go through um, having changed the pads at the first uh, pit stop because uh, they don't have to conserve anything. Get the pad change over, they can then hopefully run strong to the very end of the race. And Mark Scaife, I think, is getting more and more depressed because it's not just brake pads, it's not just tyres, it's not just wheels, it's not just fuel. They have the bonnet up, the Nissan GTR is in trouble. Having fought so hard, having lost a wheel on lap 23, Jim Richards went up into the lead again on lap 47, having fought his way up from 12th to the lead, only to come in on lap 46, and now it looks as though their race is almost run. Charles Stewart, perhaps, in the pits can tell us. Yes, Murray, they've already been in here for more than three minutes now, so this is a very bad pit stop for them. They're saying that they're not quite sure, but it sounds like the car has lost all its water. They're not certain, but if that's the case, it's not a very good scenario at all. It's a bit terminal if it's a water-cooled engine, and needless to say, the Nissan is. And that's very bad news. You can see they're cranking over the engine there. You can see the V-belt turning. Maybe they're trying to check on the whether or not the water pump is working. The mechanic's hands on the right have got the airline, which keeps the car up in the air. But the Nissan now is well out of the running. It's disappeared right off the lap chart. And Mark Scaife, of course, there will be bitterly disappointed. He'd look forward to this race, the pre prestigious Ni Nissan 500, and naturally, Jim Richards, Mark Scaife, and all the Nissan people very much hoped that their own car was going to win the race that the company was sponsoring. Doesn't look as though that's going to be the situation. We are on lap 54, so we're well over one-third distance. Or in fact, we're on our way to half distance now. Half distance will be 62 and a half laps, and so we're on lap 54. And you're looking at the lead car now. It's the blue Sierra of Glenn Seaton and Colin Bond. And behind them, in second position, the Holden Commodore of Thomas Metzera with Dick Johnson fighting back. And time for a break from Eastern Creek. Eastern Creek, you are watching the famous 05, Andrew Medecki at the wheel. That is the car that Peter Brock went off in earlier today, and Medecki in that car is in fourth position. Now, still leading, and we are on lap 56 out of 125, it's the Seton Bond Sierra, but only 11 seconds ahead of Thomas Messera in the Larry Perkins Holden. 
in third position it's Dick Johnson the great man himself in the Sierra so we've got Sierra's first and third and fourth this one now I've been watching I know I sometimes get a bit alarmist win but I have been watching the uh, Peter Brock car there and it, it looks a bit sickly to me yeah it is emitting quite a bit of smoke Murray during the sprint championship uh, this year Peter seems to have got an awful lot of power out of the car but when he does this he does emit an awful lot of smoke I wouldn't be too worried but just keeping an eye on it and see what's happening okay 05 there's the car watch the right hand side when he changes gear you sometimes see a big puff of uh, smoke coming out of the side there you are you saw it there well we'll keep we'll keep tabs on it meantime it is in that car of course Andrew Medecki the 40 year old man from Port Macquarie and he is doing his best to close the gap now he's into the long long straight building up to about 230 k's as he goes past the empty grandstand in top gear of course now down to about 280 just before he turns into the left hander at turn one and into the pits now from sixth position becomes comes the Ashby Reed Commodore but you are watching the Dickie. now there is the Commodore Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed, the co-drivers and incidentally it's Trevor Ashby's 40th birthday today out of the car tr driver change so Ashby has got a great deal to be proud about he's got that car up into sixth position on the leaderboard only four years experience in racing and getting one of these big brutal tough Commodores round the circuit for 57 successive laps is very tiring and now we wait for the 58th lap and Charles Stewart has news in the pits. Thank you, Murray. Well, Jim Richards is with me. Jim, uh, you're very philosophical about the end of the race for you, but it must be disappointing. Well, yes, it always is disappointing not to finish a race, but, uh, you know, we gave it our best shot. The uh, the car was going superbly. No problem at all, and we got a, uh, a little bit of overheating, which we think it may have perhaps got a leaky head gasket or something like that, and then when the car stopped, it wouldn't restart. So, uh, unfortunately, we're out. Who would you put your money on now for the rest of the race? Who would you put your money on if you were betting on the rest of the race? Well, I don't know who's still going at there, to be honest. Uh, if the Commodore is still going good and strong, I'd probably say that that's got a good good show. Thank you very much, Jim. Can I just say a uh, hi to Fred, back in hospital there, getting his arm mended. Hi, Fred. Sorry we couldn't do any better, but maybe next time. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Jim was saying hi to Fred Gibson, who is, of course, the Nissan team manager, who was here with his arm in a sling when we all arrived a couple of days ago, but has had to go into hospital to have it pinned. He was hoping to be here today, but he's not. So from all of us here at Eastern Creek, Fred, your day hasn't finished terribly well. We're sorry about that. But things are still going well from most other people's point of view. And on lap 59, look, there's the blue car, number 35. And you can see right behind him, there's, get, there's possibly going to be a change of lead here. No, because it's Drew Price and George Fury. It's not the Glenn Seaton car, but in second position in that picture and in second position in the race is Thomas Mitzera going through in the Holden. So, still leading, Glenn Seaton, Colin Bond, Sierra. Still in third position, it is the Dick Johnson Sierra. In fourth place, it is the famous 05 Sierra of Peter Brock and Andrew Medecki. In fifth position, and this is excellent, Mark Gibbs and Rowan Onslow, who have regained that position after quite a long tire stop and making up the numbers on the leaderboard. The two Brabham brothers are sixth in the same team as Alan Jones. And so, with Mitzera making up time on the leader, who is going to have to come in and make a tyre change, of course, as probably will Mitzera later on. Time to leave Eastern Creek for just a while. Back at Eastern Creek on lap 61, we're waiting for the leader to come through, and it is as before Glenn Seaton, Colin Bond, and still behind them Thomas Mitzera. But Mitzera 
is only 11 seconds now ahead of Dick Johnson in third place. It's all boiling up, isn't it, Daryl? Certainly is, Murray. Been a great uh, race of changing fortunes. And, of course, they're all on the unknown here, Murray. This is a circuit they have done a little bit of testing. It did rain in most of those occasions, so they're not sure how far the rubber's going to last. They're not sure about the fuel consumption. They're not sure about the brakes. And then, of course, this heat today, and there are clouds around them. Uh, a thunderstorm is predicted this afternoon. Of course, it happened yesterday. So there's a, a lot of things here that come into play yet. And only now are we approaching half distance as you look at car number 20 there, which is that of the Brabham brothers. Didn't see who was in the cockpit at the moment. If it's the primarily blue helmet, it is Gary Brabham sitting on the left-hand side of the car. They're going well. They are in sixth position at the present moment. The two Brabham brothers driving together, both of them with Formula One experience for the first time in a touring car race and really enjoying it. They get on extremely well together. Charles Stewart, Pitts News. Yes, thank you, Murray. I've got David Brabham with me. David, in sixth place now, you're running pretty well. Uh, not too bad. We're running fairly consistently. Uh, didn't do too good on the first lap. I dropped a few places, but uh, as soon as I started pushing hard, the temperature started to go up. So I had to maintain some consistency on what, what the water temperature was reading. And uh, Gary's running about the same times now, so hopefully we can just maintain that to the finish. What does it mean to you today, driving, co-driving with your brother like this? Well, it's a first time for us, so it's quite special. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the future we can do some more. What about you at the moment? Your future is uncertain. Does that prey on your mind? Well, not today, it's not. I'm not thinking about it at the moment. Uh, I've got a job in hand and this is to try and do as best we can here in this race. After the race, I'll start worrying about it. David, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. David Brabham, there's his brother Gary out, just coming through to complete another lap and it'll be coming up to his half distance. They're sharing the distance between them and the leader has just gone through the Glen Seaton Colin Bond car. And there's about a 50 second gap between Seaton and Bond and Matsera in the Holden. A couple of interesting points to come out of driving the Sierras. Colin Bond said yesterday that he found this car was a lot easier to drive than his own. He thought that uh, the Caltex car didn't drive as smoothly as this car. It certainly didn't come out of the corners as well as this car, and yet he felt the Caltex car had more grunt. And when it must be funny for drivers to sort of switch because basically they should be the same, but it's like everything else. You can set them up almost identically, but everything has its own sort of soul, I guess, and its own characteristics. Sure, I mean, there is so much to converting a basic road car, which is what these are, into a racing machine. Um, even the body stress, you can tell when, for instance, a body's had enough because you'll get a cracked windscreen just in body stress, body twist, so much easier than you would in one that's uh, a more rigid body, a newer shell. So all sorts of factors like that go into making a, a Group A racing car. Colin Bond has really enjoyed driving this car. He said it's quite amazing uh, how much smoother and it's a lot easier to drive. He said you don't get as physically tired as driving uh, the Caltex car that he has used to been running. And of course he's had some terrible luck there. Graham Crosby wrote one of the cars off basically just four weeks before Bathurst. I happened to be there that day at Oran Park during testing and a rainstorm steered off and, and just about wrecked the car and he'd been going so well and was looking for consistency but he said it put him so far behind for the rest of the season but jumping into this car now with Seaton he's very happy well Collins actually had some good results this year very good results it was a shame to see so much damage done to his car at uh, the Adelaide Grand Prix and he hit the wall quite hard what is interesting when you get these guest drives with other teams you pick up little things that uh, may be better, may be worse. You often don't talk about it too much, but for sure you go away and put it onto your own car. Well, Murray, the other thing is the Brabham boys were saying in uh, in their case, they couldn't believe about how much suspension travel and how, how the car sort of rolled around corners and whatever. They've enjoyed it, but they said they've really had to learn to drive again to adapt to the touring car. Yeah, it is something uh, very different for them. But meantime, I'm up to my famous uh, gap measuring, uh, Daryl, because I car number 35, which is the seat bond car, has gone through. I'm waiting now for Thomas Metzera to go through in the mighty Holden. And then in third position behind him, no, we have a change, because now in third position, it was my fault, because in third position is Dick Johnson, and in fourth position behind him, 
it is the Brock Medecki car. Well, there's the race leader. Now, the question is, is the Sierra going to be fragile? It's got a heck of a lot of horsepower, feeding them all through the, the rear wheels. Is it going to go the distance? Well, that's been the question mark over Sierra's in these long-distance events for some time, Win Percy. But uh, Seaton has had victory at Sandown, which was, I think, his first major through. It was his first major breakthrough uh, since forming his own team. So he'd be very hungry for a win in this, the last race of the season. Yeah, the trouble is, though, it's very easy to sit down before the race in the, the calm of the pit or a reasonable calm of the pit and work out the boost that you're going to run. You're determined to stick to it. Off go one or two cars in the distance. The ability is from the driver's seat to increase the boost, increase the power of the engine. And it's very, very tempting. It's, uh, it takes a lot of willpower to actually leave the motor car as it is. I believe Glenn has got that willpower and uh, he's shown it up in the long distance races this year. Let's say because this is the last race of the season when there will be some very important changes made to the Group A Touring category next year. Now I know that you've been running around trying to do some final things for the Holden this year. What is the difference now next year, say from the Sierra to the Holden and maybe the Nissan? Just very briefly and, and in sort of in layman terms, what can we expect next season? Well, hopefully a lot closer racing. Um, maybe we've gone a little bit wrong in our thoughts. I don't know. We've, uh, or the Sierras are allowed to take 85K off of their weight. They have a fuel now, which means they can increase their power quite dramatically. The Holden also is lose, allowed to lose weight, but um, we're finding it difficult to know quick where to lose it from without spending vast amounts of money on Kevlar, etc. But we are allowed to promote or to achieve more power from the engine. But again, that does take quite a lot of uh, money to find the, that power and convert the engine. Well, let's hope that you can find that money because everybody would like to see the Commodore be competitive when we get good close racing. Right, you're looking at the leader. We'll take a break. Be back shortly. Welcome back right around Australia, wherever you're watching this, the Eastern Creek inaugural touring car race. In fact, the first major touring car race at this brand new circuit. You're looking at the Peter Brock car 05 running in fourth position at the moment and battling its way back, almost a lap back. In fact, from first to fourth, that's from Seaton's car back to Brock. It's 1.35, 1 minute 35, which is almost a lap. Here's uh, one of the cars going off. That's a Gary Rogers car going off. Fights his way back over the loose stuff. Comes out of the gravel, onto more gravel, and back onto the circuit. Win Percy, a bit of rally driving there from the Rogers car. Also going in as uh, the Calix car of the Matthew father and son team. And they've been in and out of the pits uh, all day today. They've had all sorts of problems leasing that car off Colin Bond, the spare car of Bonds, into the pits. All sorts of problems for the father and son team and uh, that's a great thing to be able to drive your son in a race like this win yes it certainly is they uh, they started off very strongly then uh, they had a couple of pit stops they're actually changing tires now so obviously they're not that worried and there's uh, very disappointing news for the gibbs onslow car as we mentioned kevin bartlett's had a lot to do with the gio car the bobby forbes headed car that's gone so well a privateer commodore been a really big try this year. They've put a lot of work into their preparations. Congratulations to all of their sponsors. They've done a super job, but out of running today. Well, Murray Walker, we should update everybody back from one through four. Right, and we're on lap 73 out of what we expect to be 125 laps. And you see the lead car, number 35, back of Glenn Seaton and Colin Bond coming into the pits. Now, we should therefore see very shortly as the Sierra comes to a standstill, the Holden Commodore of Larry Perkins and Thomas Metzera going through. Now, car 35, the one you're looking at, and into the lead goes Metzera as they change positions between Glenn Seaton and Colin Fong. They've lost the lead because now it's the Holden back into the lead. And that car, Last was in the lead at uh, the end of the 42nd lap. And there's Thomas Metzera, the Czechoslovakian-born driver, the winner at Bathurst, and still the previous leader is in the pits. It's been a long, long stop, but he gets away 
well down through the field, but we are still waiting for the Dick Johnson, John Bow Sierra to come through. That will be in second place, and it looks to me as though the Sierra that you see there, Seaton and Bond are actually are going to get back on the circuit in second or third position. We'll soon see it's third place because the Johnson Bow car has gone through. So now on lap 74, 125 lap race, in the lead by about uh, 20 seconds is Thomas Metzera in the Holden. Up into second place after their problem now, there are the leaders. Up into second place after their problems earlier on, Dick Johnson, John Bow in the Sierra, second at Bathurst this year, first last year. In third position, the car that was in fourth, first place, Seaton and Bond. Then in fourth place, and smoking, and I still say, Daryl, looking sick to me, is the Brock car. Well, when Percy, that's been a, a thing with Brock's car this year, that it's always chuffed out a little bit of smoke. In fact, Dickie Johnson has said a number of times in the television coverage, he almost chokes following the Brock car. I don't think that's too unusual. I think that's the way it runs very rich. Yes, it doesn't seem to be losing any pace at all, Daryl. It's, um, it's something that Peter stumbled on. It's a way of creating power, I'm afraid. Uh, he's probably using more petrol than he'd want to use to, to create that uh, black smoke, but it's giving him power. He doesn't seem to be suffering at all by it, although it does look as if it's getting progressively worse. Sure does. It uh, usually comes out in big puffs, but it seems to be coming out in a continuous stream now. So maybe it is uh, a little bit more than what has been happening all of the year, but I've uh, seen some funny instances this year where Dick Johnson said it's like following a smoke screen. <laughs> He's still choking on all that good mobile. It certainly makes you sick if you stay there too long. So you're looking at the 05, the Brock car, you have had their problems. He spun off in the early part of this race, has been into the pits a number of times. Now it's uh, smoking rather badly. We'll have to wait and see if that's a terminal problem or just part of the way that the car has been set up. Fourth position, the Sierra coming into the long 11 seconds flat out straight. It puts a tremendous pressure on the engine, of course. And then the brakes is at about 280k. Now there, car number 17 is the Dick Johnson John Bow car, which is in second position. And it's... Just watch it carefully. See, we're 75 laps now. We're, we're very well into this race. And the casualty rate in terms of broken motor cars is very good indeed. There are still 26 running out of the 36 that started, but Sarah has just gone through to start his 76 lap. Now, look at that great burst of smoke from the back of the Johnson Bow car, and they've got about the length of the finishing straight between the first two cars. You saw Metzera going into the left-hander, turn one, just as the Johnson car, number 17 there, came out of turn 12. So, because we know it takes about 11 or 12 seconds to go down the straight, that is about the distance time between them at the present moment. And we still wait for the Colin Bond car with Glenn Seaton that rejoined in third place, having led for so long, to go through, and it's done so. First, second, and third then on their 76th lap, and in fourth position behind them, with still a long way to go, the Brabham brothers doing extraordinarily well in their first race together, and then it is the Sierra of Drew Price and George Fury. Dick Johnson, a marvellous competitor with Percy, one of the great characters of Australian motorsport and always there to the finish. I mean, he's a fighter through and through our Dick from Queensland, but uh, certainly has his problems sometimes in long distance racing. The car's been brilliant in the sprint series, but just suffering those little minor things, those little setbacks that go so frustratingly close to, uh, to taking the event. Yeah, I think Dick's one of these drivers. He is a press on man. He finds it very difficult to uh, not run the maximum power that the engine will produce. And uh, yes, sometimes it fails because of that. It's just having that ability perhaps to squeeze it backward a little bit just to make it more reliable. Very frustrating and very difficult to do. But he's certainly performing well here today. Having a little bit of trouble with the slower traffic and that is a problem as Alan Jones stated earlier on for these big fast cars, particularly if they catch those cars around the back part of the circuit, the very tight part of the circuit. Sierra is so uh, fast and using all of the road.
road. They need all of the road, and they what they don't need is a slower car sandwiched in between them, particularly when the chase is on now. There we are, car 11, 16.17 seconds ahead of that car you're looking at now. And Gad Darrell, the gap between second and third, that's the Johnson Bow car and the Seaton Bond car, is 25 seconds. So in round figures, that's uh, about 40 seconds between first and third. It's still very close on lap 77. It could still change as far as the lead is concerned, but the Holden seems to be looking good. Long way to go yet, there's no doubt about that. So can the Holden win? Can the Sierras fight back? Will the rains come? All of those questions will be answered this afternoon. Stay with us and we'll take a vote. Australia, 77 laps gone down the zero of Fury Brabham up there in fourth place, doing a great job. Drew Price and Peter Drop, uh, Brock dropping back a place there and moving into the pits. But here we are now looking at the Larry Perkins car, Thomas Mazera. Thomas Mazera in behind the wheel at the moment. Of course, shared the winning drive at Bathurst with Tony Longhurst. This time driving, or this time round, driving with Larry Perkins as he did at Bathurst this year. This is 05 coming in, a replay of 05 coming into the pits. We're waiting for it now. You can see Peter Brock standing there waiting to take over. Bang, in they come. Now, watch this. Everybody seems to think the driver changes a panic. It's not really because by the time they change the wheels, providing that the drivers are much the same height and same build, the belts aren't too bad. They flick them off. Win Percy as you're coming down pit lane. Peter then puts it on. It's only a matter of really tightening them down. So they've got time if they take, take it as a consistent pace. Yeah, normally the outgoing driver slackens the belts off as he comes down the pit lane, puts them over his shoulders, removes the aerial lead, prepares himself, doesn't get flustered. Kelmy gets out, the second guy gets in, the exiting driver helps him with his belts but doesn't interfere and that's it. So that's the changeover from Brock. Now, you know, since its release in the late 1970s, the Australian-made Holden Commodore has become part of local motorsport legend. Outgunned by the Sierras and Nissans in recent seasons, the Commodore charged back into flavour via an inspiring victory at Bathurst this year by the man beside him, of course, Alan Grice. Not surprisingly, that racing machine is a far cry from the friendly family sedan you might have waxed and polished up this morning. This is the heart of the Holden V8 Commodore. It's a big five litre engine, 510 horsepower. We rev it up to 7,500 for the technically minded. It hasn't got a fancy turbocharger or overhead camshafts like the Nissan and the uh, Sierra, but it is a very reliable engine and car. We've proved it in uh, races before and today we obviously hope we can prove it again. A few things against it though, it consumes uh, five mile per gallon, uses a lot of petrol. It's a big heavy car, takes a lot of stopping. If we go onto the brakes, for instance now, we've got massive brakes down here, 13 inch diameter discs, inch and a half wide. We'll have to make one pad change tomorrow, today that is. Uh, but no problem with the brakes, everything reliable. We've done all our calculations on a dry race today, but if it should rain, all our calculations go out the window. We won't need to make brake pad changes, we will have to make tyre changes. And that's when the pit work of uh, our crew come into their own and the winner could easily be determined in the pits. Okay, let's go to the uh, business end of the show now. This is the office personally set up for myself. Gear lever very handy to get at, brakes, everything nicely set up for what we have to do and that is race the car. We've got our instrument cluster here, everything set up dual, dual fuel pumps, dual scavenge pumps, dual coolers, everything for reliability. In these long races we have to have spares of everything. Very sparse instrument cluster, only a water temperature gauge, oil pressure gauge and a big rev counter. Steering wheel tailor made to suit me. Very good seat belts. Pedals that 
pivot down on the floor for the technically minded again. Five speed gearbox, made in Australia. No synchro mesh though, so people who are used to nice gear changes beware with this particular one. This is the uh, engine management system, a critical part of it, wholly made in Australia, controls all the functions of the big V8, proving again that you don't have to get anything fancy from overseas to be competitive. We are on lap 82 at Eastern Creek and Thomas Netzera, number 11 in the Holden, is leading. He has a comfortable cushion, but Dick Johnson, second in the Sierra, is slowly eating into it. The gap has come down from 14 seconds to 13 seconds to just over 12. Now, I'm quite sure that Metzera knows what the score is, as does Dick Johnson. They will both be watching pointers very carefully. We're two-thirds into the race, 81 laps completed out of 125, and the Holden is certainly looking good. It's strong. It handles extremely well. It has no turbocharger to interrupt the power flow and affect the tyre performance. And if they can keep going as they are, they're looking very good indeed. In third position, having come in for their tyre stop, the previous leaders, Glenn Seaton and Colin Bond. In fourth place, but lapped, the Brabham brothers in the Sierra. In fifth position, it is the famous 05 car of Peter Brock and Andrew Medecki. And in sixth place, completing the leaderboard, another Sierra, Drew Price and George Fury. Then a lap behind them in seventh position, the Tony Longhurst, Alan Jones car. We heard from Alan earlier on that they were having a problem and could only get a maximum of 6,000 revs. And then behind them, Kevin Waldock and Andrew Bagnall in the Playscape car, that yellow Sierra, which has done so well this year. Kevin Waldock bought the team from Playscape and uh, developed the franchise this year. And we have to leave Eastern Creek shortly, but be back soon. You are looking at the Brock Medecki Sierra, which is in fifth position. It is still in the lead, Thomas Metzera in the Holden ahead of Dick Johnson. Dick Johnson eating into Metzera's lead. It's now down to 11.2 seconds. Third and the only other car on the same lap, the Seaton Bond Sierra. And in fourth position, the Brabham Brothers. You know who's fifth? There they are. And in sixth position behind them, the Drew Price George Fury car. Now we've been hypothesizing about the fact that this car 05 is in trouble because of all the smoke that's been pouring out of it. But Charles Stewart is with Andrew Medecki and I'm sure he will be able to tell us. Andrew, the big question up in the commentary box is, is 05 in trouble because of all the smoke that it continually puts out? No, I don't uh, think so. That's uh, one of our secret weapons. And, uh, it's certainly nothing to worry about and we really uh, Will that car be running strong, strong, strong at the end? Uh, are you happy about the way the car is going today? Yeah, I think the car's been uh, been fairly, been really quite good. It's been better than me so far today. So that's, that's saying something. Yes. Now you were telling me earlier you had a slight medical problem today. What is it? Well, I had uh, I had a real problem in practice in, in that I could just found I couldn't go fast, and I had I've had for some time a uh, an ear infection. It turned out to be a, an inner ear problem, which uh, the local track doctor. Uh, put me on to a, uh, probably uh, one of Sydney's leading specialists, Joe Havas, who uh, got up even earlier than he normally does this morning and did an operation on both ears to drain the fluid. And, uh, you know, while I'm not 100%, I'm, uh, at least I'm here today. It affects your stability, does it? <laughs> there are some people that say my stability is affected all the time, but I think it's only part of the time. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. Back to Murray Walker in the commentary position. With Percy, while we look at the smoking Sierra, which is coming through to complete its 86th lap in fifth position, we are now two-thirds of the way through the first ever Nissan 500 at Eastern Creek. Three and a half hour race, and it looks as though it's going to run almost exactly to those three and a half hours. It is hot out there. It's very tough indeed for the machinery. 
We've lost about 10 cars so far. Would you expect a lot more to go out in the last third of the race? I don't really think so, Murray. The attrition rate's pretty low, as you just said. Uh, we thankfully haven't had any pace car interventions, so time's going very well. The laps are keeping up. The times are going extremely well. Um, no, it looks to me as if the cars out there are running very strongly. Well, we've just heard from Andrew Medecki that he has no worries about the smoking 05 Sierra. It's Peter Brock at the wheel now. What a fantastic history that man has. Daryl. Andrew's problem with his middle ear infection, Murray, is something I can relate to. It's uh, very similar to a thing they call swimmer's ear that's very common in this country. And by gee, it really is quite painful. And you lose a lot of your balance. And that was the reason why he couldn't drive so quickly yesterday. So it is a major problem and it's very, very hard. And having that helmet on wind doesn't help because all that moisture and condensation gets back in the ear and it only sort of makes it worse. So it's a pretty brave effort to really get out and do as well as he's done. Yes, it is. Plus, of course, the noise. Into the pits comes the race leader, Thomas Metzera. He's driving past the blue flag and there he is. Metzera into the, into the pits. Now, let's see what happens. A lot of activity down there. Off comes the front wheel, off comes the rear wheel. Out gets Metzera, calmly, coolly and methodically gets in the previous race leader, Larry Perkins, who of course brought the Holden into the pits for its first tyre stop in the lead. And it looks like a pretty smooth stop to me, except for the right rear. There's a problem on the nuts of the right rear of the Commodore, right rear wheel. Well, you can see the others have got their arms up well. That right rear wheel sticking undoubtedly held things up. And now into the lead of the Nissan 500 has gone Dick Johnson. He was only 11 seconds behind Metzera when Metzera came into the pits. You're looking at the race leader, Dick Johnson, now. And it looks as though, Dick, now we're on lap 87. It's going to be a real thriller down to the end, Daryl. No doubt about that. Well, just going back to that ear infection, that noise you were talking about, uh, when it really would be uh, painful out there. Yes, it's quite surprising how noisy uh, a touring car is. It's completely hollowed out, as you can imagine, inside. And uh, it does affect you in a long race. Yeah, OK, Dick Johnson out in front. And as you can see now, a classic battle shaping up, and it's that old battle again, Ford versus Holden, the thing that we talked about. You were saying many years ago when you were watching uh, the Bathurst 1000 races screened over in Great Britain, how it was always the battle between that make of car, Ford, and, of course, the car running second, now the Holden. I must admit, the first time I ever saw it, uh, the way the, uh, the race is presented on TV over here, um, I must admit, I looked at the thing and thought those guys must be out of their trees. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to drive the track. It's a really exciting place. And although Dick's doing so well at the moment, we must remember that he's got a pit stop to come yet. He can't possibly go to the finish of this race. Yeah, I think Larry Perkins would be pretty happy with what's happened so far because he really has run his tactics as he predicted in the pitch yesterday. He said that he's very, very happy with the tyres. He was getting great grip out of the car and he thought that the two stops and the change of pads would be right. There's uh, one of the Sierras of the uh, Seaton team coming in. That's car 30. Second and third. Now, there's the battle there for you. So the second of the, uh, the Seaton Sierras now closed right up on the Holden Commodore. Really seeing a good dice happening there, Murray. 44 second gap between Dick Johnson in the lead and this battle for second position with Larry Perkins in the white Commodore second. And third behind him, the Glen C car. Well, as I said, I think Larry Perkins would be pretty happy with what's happening so far because he said it is a Holden-friendly circuit here, and as it's turned out, everything has gone to plan. This is the most important stint win, Percy, for this Holden because if he has any problems now, everything comes undone, but if he can keep running to this pace, that's exactly where he thought he would have been. I think Larry's in a very, very good position at the moment, and interestingly enough, the way that Thomas has handled the car today, uh, Thomas, over the last couple of seasons, his driving skills have improved so much. He's done lots of running overseas in Group C and Group A, and it really has shown up here today. He's done a splendid job. When you're selecting your team drivers, I mean, you've got to look at consistency, I guess, driver size and all of those things. These drivers very evenly matched. They are. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said there was a good second plus between Larry's expertise and uh, Thomas. Now today, I think they've both shown that they're equal and they've so far done an excellent job. If the car stays as strong as it is at the moment, 
it does look very good for them. Another interesting point yesterday, one of your team drivers, Neil Crompton, has now driven the Holden, obviously, for you. He's also driven Brock Sierra yesterday. He had a run in the Nissan, so the three cars, he's one of the few drivers to try out the three models. He said the Nissan was by far the easiest car to drive, then the Commodore, then the Sierra. Yes, he found the turbo power of the Sierra, the, the instability of on and off of throttle was very difficult to get used to. He was absolutely raving about the uh, Nissan, the way that he could power out of corners. In fact, when he phoned me to say, can I have your permission to go ahead and drive it? I said, no, I want to come and do it myself. But uh, I couldn't, so he had the job. So one of the drivers with a rare chance to drive three cars. Oh, another car coming off there. That's car 20, the Brabham car. Yeah. Just a little slide, comes up onto the grass, over onto the rough stuff. Then they'll get back on the track. We'll get back on the track after this break. out of 125 entering the closing stages of the first ever Nissan 500 at Eastern Creek and you are looking at the leader but is Dick Johnson in the famous car 17 the Red Sierra going to be able to hold that lead he's 45 seconds as he comes into the straight down to turn one to complete his 96th lap ahead of Larry Perkins in the Holden but there is little doubt in our mind that Dick Johnson there is going to have to come in for another tar stop, whereas we are confident that Larry Perkins is on the last stint and he is not going to make a tar stop. Now, Perkins in third position is increasing the gap between himself and the Glenn Seaton Colin Bond car, which is in third position. In fourth position, but lapped, is the Brock and Medecki Ford Sierra. Then in fifth position behind them, it is the Tony Longhurst Alan Jones car, which has not been at all well since the beginning of the race. Then a further lap back in sixth position, Drew Price and George Fury. So we're watching here, number 17, Dick Johnson, who with John Bow is in the lead, but down in the pits with Gary Brabham is Charles Stewart. Thank you, Murray. Well, it's a, a different excursion for you, Gary. How have you been finding it? <laughs> it's going really well. Um, you know, when I first drove the car, I thought, my God, you know, it's, it's just such a, a horrible thing to drive. Um, but after a couple of times you drive it, it gets a lot better and, and then it becomes fun and I, I've been really enjoying it. What about uh, the position you're lying in in this race? You've been doing fairly well. Was that what you expected? Well, I'm hoping we we're going to do better because um, about lap 20 in my stint, uh, something went wrong with one of the tyres and it went down to the canvas. So now I was cruising on low 40s all the time in the first 20 laps and then all of a sudden I had the tyre problem. So I had to cruise on four, high 41s, low 42s, just to, to bring the car back home in one piece and um, hand over to David. Gary, thank you very much. Back to Murray Walker in the commentary position. Where you can see Dick Johnson in the pits fulfilling our forecast. And I'm waiting now to see Larry Perkins and the Holden burst into sight over the skyline. The crowd waves. There is the distinctive white shape. And it is coming down towards me now. It's no doubt about it. But Dick Johnson is getting ready. It's the closing stages of their, their pit uh, stop. And the second car that you're looking at now is the Holden, which takes the lead on lap 97 as Dick Johnson roars out of the pits. It's going to be a real cliffhanger because Johnson now is on a new rubber. There's very little between the leader. There they are absolutely together. Larry Perkins in the white Commodore, Dick Johnson in the red Sierra. It's going to be a mighty battle now. And I must say that... Although I forecast that it would be a victory for the Holden, it's looking good for the Sierra, I think, Daryl. Well, it's a great stop from the Dick Johnson team win, Percy. I mean, they came in, they knew that Larry Perkins was lurking around. Perkins just got through, but of course, Johnson there on fresh rubber. Yes, it was a very good stop. It's John Bow in the car, actually, which is very a good idea. It's, it's very intelligent thinking. I know every driver wants to, to finish the race, be the one in the car, but John was stood there, he's fresh. 
and it's going to be a battle to the finish so i think they've done the right thing it really should be a very interesting finale to this well the dice has been thrown many ways during this race which way do you see it thrown now well you've got to look at the fact that john is on fresh rubber now he's already done quite a few wraps on uh, laps on his rubber um, i really wouldn't like to say it really is going to be a battle john actually is in the better position he can see the opposition he's got fresh rubber he can be a little bit more sensible than perhaps Larry, who's got to go for it. Do you think he should play a waiting game or try and charge up to the Perkins car now? If I was in the number 17 car, I would be a little bit careful with the tyres the first five or six laps before I got too carried away, then start putting the pressure on. Be quite content with the distance I am behind the Commodore. Comments from Wynn Percy, the man that won the Bathurst 1000 in the Commodore. Murray. Just two seconds between the leaders now on lap 99 out of 125. And as you can see, they've both got a clear track in front of them because John Bow can see the white Commodore ahead of him. He knows that's the opposition. And Larry Perkins, he certainly won't have time to stop. He's got to keep going now. No matter what state his tyres are on, if he thinks he can finish off them, on them, he's got to go right to the end of this race. And that is another 26 laps, whereas John Bow is on new rubber, as we've heard before. Darrell. Dick Johnson is in the pits with Charles Stewart. Well, now botting time for Dick. Yes, Dick, uh, two seconds between your car and Larry Perkins. Fairly nail-biting and stuff for you? It's a good race, eh? <laughs> it took a while for me to get my backside into gear because uh, my eyes have been playing up the last week, so uh, fortunately I overcame that and we sort of started trucking on doing some decent times. But it's going to be a hell of a race to the end, and I think... Uh, It'll be good for the guys if they can have a win this year. Is it going to be hard for you sitting here in the pits and watching Johnny Bow drive? No, I'm, I've got every confidence in the guy. He's, he's an excellent driver and I know he'll do his very, very best. And uh, hopefully he'll just bring the car home. Yes, what about the car? Have you been having any problems with it at all? The car's absolutely perfect. You know, it's a credit to the guys. They've done a fabulous job on the car. Uh, and in their pit stops, you know, we made up like 10 seconds in a pit stop. And that's what it's all about, a professional team, and I think we've got the best in Australia. Can you make up the two seconds? Oh, I sincerely hope so. I bet you John would be trying his damnedest. Thank you very much. Okay. Under two seconds now, and you can see that for yourself. That's John Bow and the Johnson Ultra Shell car, the Red Sierra, chasing the white Commodore with Larry Perkins at the wheel, the engineer. The man who really is so laid back with his racing has driven Formula One for BRM many years ago. Lots of experience, Murray, and he would dearly love to win this. Believe you me, he was he was so upset over the Bathurst incident that cost him the race. Of course he would. It's going to be a very prestigious victory for whichever of them wins, assuming one of them does. All sorts of things can happen. But, Darrell, we've both said this many times before, their performance looks to be very even indeed. And for John Bow to catch Larry Perkins is one thing. But it looks to me as though he hasn't got the grunt to get straight past him. So catching him is one thing, passing him is another. Win Percy, your comments to that. Uh, it is interesting. At a track like this, the straight is the only real place for two fairly equal cars. And is getting onto the straight. And the Commodore perhaps will have that advantage. The only thing is, of course, John maybe has the ability in the cab to boost the engine slightly towards the end. So uh, it's anybody's, but it really is a very good ending to this race. Yes, there they go. And just to, just to keep you in touch, it is the Glen Seaton Colin Bond car in third position. They are a lap ahead of the Peter Brock car. And here they come. Now, last time it was 1.82 seconds. They crossed the line, and it's 2.09 seconds. I know that's not very much. Three-tenths of a second increase, but it is an increase. That means to say that Larry Perkins has got the measure of the opposition. Well, it's interesting, Murray, because Larry Perkins bowled at a special qualifying engine in yesterday to get the time that he did to place the car so high on the grid in front of the... In fact, on the front row. But he was quite confident that the race engine wouldn't be that far off the pace. Now, the difference between the qualifying engine, it may do 100 k's if it was lucky, and he said, really, it just made it. But this engine, he knows, can go the distance, and it's not that far down on horsepower 
the big thing that he said he had in his favour was tyres that were very, very good on this circuit. Lap 101, and we know that the Holden is not hard on tyres. I think it could be things like back markers that decide this race now. It looks as though the two seconds gap at the moment is fairly static. And now John Bauer has got an opportunity to close up on Barry Perkins, who has got two slower men in front of him. He's got to get past them and somehow endeavour to get them between him and John Bauer and the Red Sierra. Lap 101. Now there you are, there's the traffic and you can see Larry Perkins pulls out, he gets past two cars, where's Johnny Bauer, does he get through? He gets held up a little bit, so Larry Perkins using the traffic very, very well here indeed. Signs up again now, he's trying to place himself so he doesn't lose any revs, any power as he picks his way through the traffic. Johnny Bauer getting held up, look at Perkins weaving his way through, doing it very well like threading a needle. Yes, remember what the gap was last time, 2.09 seconds and Bow goes through 2.2 seconds. So nearly half a second increase over two laps for Larry Perkins. So the traffic making a difference with Percy. Now you know both drivers very, very well. You know that Holden car out in front. But Johnny Bow pretty cool under pressure. Really all he's got to do is keep him in sight and probably in the last 10 laps really have a big go. Would that be a fair comment? This is like watching a Senna Prost battle in Formula One, isn't it? Seeing who's got the bottle through the traffic. Oh, it's really interesting. Uh, they're both so experienced. Um, I would be amazed if either of them makes a mistake. John got the worst of the traffic there. What is interesting, that although Larry's tyres have done more work, he is able to maintain, in fact, at the moment, pull out a gap. So it still could for Larry's race. Yeah, uh, endurance races like this can sometimes turn out to be a yaw. But this one has been full of excitement, interest and incident because remember, Jim Richards led the race for a long time in the Nissan GTR, only to come in with a wheel off, then to fight his way back into the lead. We've had several different leaders. Here is the latest one, John Bauer co-driving with Dick Johnson. Murray, there's another story unfolding in this race as we wind down to this chequered flag, and that's Colin Bond in the seat in Sierra making big inroads in third place. He's about 30 seconds behind, but charging. Two Sierras then, charging very hard indeed, chasing the Larry Perkins Holden, which comes through. Now, what did I say last time? 2.2 seconds, was it? Well, I'll soon be able to tell you what it is this time, because as Bauer goes through, it is over three seconds. 3.1 seconds, so Perkins has benefited from the traffic. But I'm watching now the Blue Sierra of Colin Bond and Seaton, and it's coming out, but it's not yet gated. It's closing, but it's not closing fast enough. Long way back, Murray, to make up that difference, even though it's a big drive from Colin Bond. And as I said earlier in this telecast, he really enjoys driving this car, but he's got a long way to go. Well, Murray, you've seen touring car racing all around Europe. We've always said our Group A racing is comparable to anything in the world, your opinion? Well, the British drivers uh, didn't think all that much of the Australians until the Dick Johnson car was sent over for Rob Gravitt this season, and since then no one's seen the that no one's seen anything except the back of it. Rob Gravitt won the British Championship, and the Trackstar car, which is what they call their their team, went absolutely superbly. This is an absolute match of British racing in terms of quality and fighting, but we don't have races as long as this, Daryl. It's, it's a real, real thrill for me to see a race as long as this, as close as this, so near the end. OK, well, the charge of the chequered flag is on. Larry Perkins in the Commodore is there. John Bow in the Sierra, that's the car chasing him for second, and Colin Bond is closing in third. We'll take a break. Stay with us, Australia. This is a ripper race. Eastern Creek. Larry Perkins is caught up with the traffic. We are on that 105 out of 125, and four fifths of the race distance has been completed. But Perkins in car 11, the White Holden, 
and Holden remember won Australia's great race at Bathurst earlier this year. Are they going to win the season's second most prestigious event, the Nissan 500 here at the inaugural Eastern Creek meeting? At the moment, it is looking like it because Perkins has fought his way through the traffic and now John Bow, second in the Red Sierra, is held up in his turn. Murray, some interesting facts here. Sandown earlier this year, there was 27 seconds between first and second. That was a 500 kilometre race. Bathurst, of course, is over a thousand kilometres. Only 15 seconds separated the cars between one and two there. Eastern Creek, well, it could be a lot closer than that. Absolutely. It is about two to three seconds now, depending on the traffic. And you see John Bow, number 17, is really suffering here. You can see the white Commodore disappearing over the crest and Bow is still shut in he goes through inside the Alf Grant and Tim Grant father and son Nissan HR31 and laps them and now past the David Parsons Charlie O'Brien Sierra he can see ahead of him the man he's got to get past if he's going to win here at Eastern Creek but he's going to have a real fight on in his hands indeed he's got one well, Wynn Percy, we were just talking about tyres. I said earlier in the telecast that Larry Perkins was very happy with his choice of rubber. You seem to feel that maybe the Johnson team have gone for a harder compound and it might have been the, the wrong gamble. Well, I am surprised that uh, John couldn't close the gap on fresh rubber a little earlier in this stint. Uh, Larry's on the 15s that were developed for Bathurst. They worked wonderfully well there, and it really looks as if they're the, the king here as well. Dick, as far as I know, he certainly started out on the 26s, which are the very hard rubber. As far as I know, he's still using them. So maybe it's the wrong choice. Larry Perkins then, ahead of John Bow here. What a cracking race Perkins has driven and is driving. Three times Bathurst winner, fourth at Le Mans. He's driven for Jaguar. He's driven for BRM in Formula One. He's driven for Brabham, of course, in Formula One. And here he is, scything his way through the traffic. That is the Brock Medecki car in front of him. Now, it's going to be difficult for him to get past this one, and you can see that it is still smoking hard. And this is Bow's opportunity again. The performance differential between the Holden and the Ford is small, but I was just going to say he opens the door and let him, lets him through, but he does not do so, this being lap 107. You're having a quirk of fate here, Murray, because Larry Perkins had so much to do with the Peter Brock team and uh, so much success at Bathurst. The last thing he wants to do has been held up by his old team. As Perkins finally gets past the Brock Sierra and starts to put the big legs of the Commodore into action now, and you can see the car moving around on the road. He's using all of the road. He knows exactly where John Bow is. The pits are telling him that. There's John Bow. He's got to get past the Brock car now. So really, nothing in this. The traffic, as you said, Murray's going to play a big part in it. But all, once he gets through here, John Bow, then he's going to have a clear run at Larry Perkins. And as they complete the lap, it is 1.25 seconds only between car 11, the White Holden, in the lead, and car 17, the Red Sierra, in second place. But between the two of them is the 05 Brock Medecki car. Now, is he going to let John Bow through? It doesn't look like it to me. There's no doubt about the fact that he can see him. That big red blob will be enormous in his rear view mirror, lap 108. Well, tactics really coming into play here. And of course, now uh, the Brock Sierra moves over and lets John Bow through. But really, has he got enough time? I think the laps are there, but he can't seem to make the inroads on Perkins that we thought he would on that fresh rubber. I was quite surprised with that. Actually, Peter cost uh, both drivers a little bit of time there. It first of all looks as if Larry had suffered badly, but uh, I think he put it out with uh, John Bow as well there. So the gap looks about uh, static again now. This really is a thriller, isn't it? No doubt about it. And I can tell you now that we spent some time late yesterday afternoon after the race storm with Larry Perkins, and he said, look, I, I just want to win a major race. I want to prove to people that this car of mine is very, very competitive. He's excited about the Commodore next year. He thinks the Commodore will be a, a most uh, competitive car on most of the circuits. So a win here vital for him, of course, Dick Johnson, the heartbreak of finishing only 15 seconds. Number two at Bathurst would also dearly love to win. So plenty of motivation for both teams. Yeah, and here they go, down the finish, down the start and finish straight again. Now, again, Larry Perkins is going to pull out and pass someone. It's uh, ahead of him at the present moment is the, the Brabham car. 
So it's traffic, traffic, traffic all the time, you see. If somebody holds Perkins up, Bauer is going to be with him. But at the moment, Larry Perkins, using all his skill and experience, after all, he's uh, 40 years old, is Larry Perkins. He's been driving a very, very long time in just about every type of competition. But he looks as though he's got a problem at the moment, not just the car in front of him, which he goes through on the inside, but then the BMW in front of that. Murray's really using the traffic very well, though. He's picking the places where he's not losing any rhythm of the car. He's just holding back and getting them one by one. And Win, I think he's doing a marvellous job. He's keeping the rhythm of the car going, and that's what it's all about, the Holden on this track, all about rhythm. Yeah, he really is driving very, very well. He's using just about every inch plus that the road has got. The black stuff, the dirt, the green stuff as well. But uh, he's really keeping the pressure on. It does look good. It really does. That car is being totally driven on the limit. Yeah, lap 109. You're watching the lead car, Larry Perkins and Thomas Mitzera in the holder. Now, in second place, just behind them, is jo the John Bow Dick Johnson car. In third position, dropping back now, Glenn Seaton and Colin Bond in their Sierra. Fourth and lapped, the Peter Brock, Andrew Medecki car. In fifth position, it is Tony Longhurst and Alan Jones's Ford Sierra. And in sixth place, Drew Price and George Fury in their Nissan, in their Sierra. But look at this, it's getting closer. The gap now is 1.4 seconds, and they are on their 110th lap in this 125 lap race. Close. John Bauer really hunched over the steering wheel too. I mean, he's got the ears pinned back. You can see him coming down the straight there and really leaning into the car. He's now got a clear run at Larry Perkins. Not too much traffic in front of them. This is going to be very interesting now with Percy. The Sierra's on fresh rubber. The Holden's on rubber that must be getting a little tired. You said that Perkins is on the limit, so is Bauer. It really is now a matter of who can hang on the longest and will that fresh rubber come into play? It certainly looks as if the traffic's playing a major part. That uh, bunch of traffic that they've just gone through the last two or three laps has certainly helped John close the gap. This is the point in a, a long race when you start to imagine all sorts of things. And news from Charles Stewart in the pits. Thank you very much, Murray. With me, I have Thomas Mazzera, who's Larry Perkins' co-driver, who's watching very anxiously when this gap is just 1.4 seconds. There is a problem, though, with the car, isn't there? There is a little problem with the alternator. We have the red light on all the time, and uh, we're a bit worried we could uh, run out of electricity in a the car. Then uh, we keep switching the oil uh, gearbox pump and a diff pump, then uh, leaving it oil to warm up up to 160 degrees, then flip the pumps on again for a couple of laps to cool it down and keep repeating it, try to save some electricity. So it's a very fine line between maintaining the, uh, the, the electrical system and uh, seizing a diff or gearbox, is that right? That's right, you, you don't want to run, uh, run it too hot, but uh, you still need the electricity to to have the engine running strongly, otherwise you could develop a misfire in a, in a top end. So, Thomas, how are the nerves sitting here watching this, all this happen for you? Well, it's so... Uh, I'd rather be out there. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident in Larry. If he will not have any problems, then uh, he, I don't think he would let John buy. He should keep his place there. Thank you very much indeed. Good luck. Thank you. Well, Thomas Matera there from Czechoslovakia calls the world his home because he's always on the move and so is Larry Perkins. Look at him now. He's right up behind the Blue Sierra and that's the Drew Price George Fury car which is actually in sixth position. So Perkins has left everybody up to sixth and John Bauer's got the same problem again. He has seen Larry pass a car. Now he knows he's got to do it or he'll drop back. Well, with Percy, people at home sitting around Australia watching it in the living room wouldn't understand how, how much work a driver's got to do. We've just heard Thomas talk about the fact they've got to switch pumps on and off. They've got to look at gauges. They've got to cool this down. While all of this is going on, looking at John Bow, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, isn't it? Yeah, these motor cars are so, so very different to a production motor car. You've got coolers, coolers for the rear axle, coolers for the gearbox. You're watching them constantly. There are instances in a race situation where a pace car comes out, you have to turn it all off because you don't want the pumps on when they're not necessary. Then back on again. 
So there you are, the busy driver at work, and that's the second place car, just a couple of seconds out of the lead. We'll come back for the run to the chequered flag. Stay with us. Welcome back, here's Larry Perkins, threading his way through the traffic. This man, Skills, look at this, he just slips straight in between the two cars. Larry Perkins with a bit of magnificent driving. With Percy, showed us how to drive a Commodore over in Adelaide last weekend. He also showed us how to do it at Bathurst. But Larry Perkins at the moment is threading the needle in fantastic style. And when you think of the speed that he's going, his judgment today is spot on. Oh, I'm getting really jealous, just stood here watching. But oh, but... Murray Walker, can you believe that bit of driving? That, 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 that absolutely sensational move. Larry must know the width of the Holden to e cigarette peeper, and it must have given him a good chance to stay ahead. Although the gap is down to one second now, and we're on lap 113, so there are still 12 to go. So the gap closing down. Larry Perkins driving the race of his life at the moment. Only a second separating him and John Bauer in the Johnson Sierra. It's Commodore Sierra. There they are, one and two. And remember, this has been 500 kilometres, and they're still winding down now. Larry Perkins is on rubber that must be getting tired. John Bauer's on rubber that's fresher, it's newer, it's healthier. But by gee, Perkins is driving the race of his life as he puts the Commodore there. Can they repeat the Bathurst win? Well, it was a Commodore. It wasn't in these colours. It was the works Commodore, but Larry Perkins was well in the running until that pit lane problem. It almost cost him the race, but Larry Perkins at the moment doing a fantastic job in front. Yeah, and he says he's got about 520 race horsepower in the Holden. He's coming up to take one of the BMW M3s in the Division 2. So there's the problem for John Bauer again. He's got to pass the BMW, but there's no problem there. And now Bauer is definitely closing. They're coming through to complete the lap. And John Bauer, the gap between him and Perkins is now down to under a second for the first time. It was three seconds, and Bow has just chiselled away, turn of the wheel by turn of the wheel, at the lead that the White Holden in front of him has got, and he's coming up to its boot lid, slowly but surely, as through on the inside of the Longhurst Jones Sierra goes Perkins, and again, John Bow has the problem. Yeah, but once again, once again, Larry Perkins has shown how he can pick the traffic. He's kept that rhythm going. He made sure he put the other Sierra in place just to give him some breathing space, Win, Yes, he really is driving very, very well. Win, uh, I am extremely impressed with the manners of the drivers here. Often in Britain, you get a bumbler who stays in front, won't move over, spoils the race. But I notice here that everybody seems to be using their mirrors extremely well. They see someone coming up behind them. They say, it's my turn to move over and let the quicker man through, and they do it. And it's as a result of that that this race is as, as superb as it is. Murray, I've just had a complete season in Australia with the Touring Car Championship and laterally the long distance races, and I would compliment all the drivers. The Touring Car driving and racing over here is as good as anywhere in the world. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this season. And we can certainly hope that you're going to come back next year and stay with us, Win. but that's a decision that you'll make in the next couple of weeks or so. That's right. OK, Larry Perkins now. Now the Ward Mercedes, of course, very competitive in Germany, but under the regulations here in Australia, not so competitive. And now John Bow gets past there, so you can see again. And again, Larry Perkins can put another car there. He just keeps placing cars between him and John Bow, and that's been the difference so far. Superb driving again from Larry Perkins. Yeah, and he's not exactly hanging about. He was doing 280k when he passed, and... Now there's Bow, and Bow is up to the Pearson Stewart Commodore, which of course Larry Perkins has already passed. And Larry was superb. Hello? Someone's put the wheel on the dust, but it looks as though, yeah, we're all clear. No problem. I think no problem for Perkins, because that passing maneuver of his there, when he got past the Pearson Stewart Commodore, and Bow did not, has definitely extended the Holden's lead. It looks as though, at the present moment, Holden enthusiasts, if they keep their fingers crossed, are going to see another superb victory 
in the 1990 season because we are almost at the end of lap 116 only nine laps to go at the end of this one it's the traffic that's making the difference John Bow is not at the moment closing on Larry Perkins in third position it is still the Seaton Bond Sierra so Sierra's are first and third uh, the Brock car has now unlapped itself and is in fourth position Brock and Medecki in fifth position behind them the Longhurst Jones Sierra and in sixth position it is yet another Sierra that of Drew Price and George Fury so here is the lone Holden and it's Larry Perkins and he's done another passing move into the 280k approach fifth gear turn one down to the hairpin turn two Murray, the other good thing about the Holden leading at the moment, and I'm unashamedly Australian, so I don't mind a Holden winning here, let me tell you, but to buy a Ford Sierra in this country, you need a lot of money to just drive a normal road car as a Ford Sierra. To buy the GTR and this, and you also need a lot of money, both fine motor cars and a racetrack, but that Holden Commodore you can actually buy here in Australia, and the fans love it because of that reason. Yeah, and if I can get my patriotic plug in, Daryl, I'd just like to make the point that Tom Walkinshaw has been fairly helpful with Holden and that Wynne Percy is as British as the flag. I knew you'd work it in. I knew you'd say it. But it's still an Aussie Commodore out in front of the moment leading that Pommy Sierra. Yeah, I can't deny it. And it's absolutely superb. Now, Medecki dives through between a couple of cars, not as spectacularly as Larry Perkins did, well, isn't, it, isn't this incredible that nearly three and a half hours after this first Nissan 500 started for the first ever major car race at Eastern Creek, we are looking at the two cars in the lead that are only separated by a couple of seconds or so and either one of which could lead. This currently looks to be the most likely one, or that did. Another puff of smoke in the background. It's not smoke, actually, it's dust. It's very dry here, despite the enormous downpour of rain that we had yesterday. And now, Perkins goes through to complete a lap, and he's pulled ahead. It is three seconds. Larry Perkins on lap 118. Knows what the score is. He, you won't rattle him. But news from the pits. Thank you, Murray. Yes, I'm here down here with Dick Johnson. Dick, anxious times for you. <laughs> I've been here so many times before, it's not funny. So uh, you really can't say anything until the, the race is finished. I think the, the gap it comes and it goes mainly because of the traffic. Well, what do you think of the, the chances that you have of actually overtaking on this circuit? They say it's a very difficult track to pass on, but do you think that's going to be a factor? I think uh, the big thing is that there's the traffic at the moment. Like once, uh, it's a matter of it's a matter of getting a. If he gets a bad run through the traffic and John gets a good run, well, he'll be right on him. And boy, I tell you what, he works pretty hard when he's like that. And what about the Sierra at this time in the race? How is it holding together? The car's fantastic, you know. So far, I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it at all. The brakes are great. The tyres have been hanging in really good. I'm very impressed indeed. And the car's just been running superb. Thank you very much, Dick. Pleasure. We're going to leave Eastern Creek for just a short time, but we will be back very soon. Stay with us. Back at Eastern Creek, five laps to go at the end of this one, and Larry Perkins has extended his lead to three seconds. It's quite incredible the way this man is driving. Cool, calm, consistent, and John Bow, try as he may, and he can see the Red Sierra in the background, seemingly can do nothing about it. Because, as we have said many times before, in this race where tyres have been so important, with Dunlop, Bridgestone and Yokohama all playing their part, so has the traffic been of great importance. Now, you see, there goes Perkins, or rather here comes Perkins, with John Bow behind him. And I've just got the stopwatch running now, and it looks to me as though he's eked out a bit more lead. Indeed he has. 3.2 seconds as the Holden goes into its 122nd lap. Now, this is the VL Holden. Next year, there's the VN, and I think Wynne Percy 
you, as Mr Holden, will be able to look forward to even better things. Yes, certainly, Murray. The new engine will certainly develop more power. The body shell is much slipperier, and a lot of these tracks are very fast, so it's something we must take into consideration. We never thought we'd still be running the VL at this stage, and we certainly never dreamt that we'd be seeing an excess of 520 brake horsepower from it, and it being as competitive as this against the Sierras. And as reliable, and winning the great race, and potentially winning the Nissan 500, because there is not very far to go now. Another four laps at the end of this one, and Larry Perkins has got a superb flowing rhythm going. He sees the cars ahead, he works out his tactics about where he's going to pass, and in doing so, he tries to make it difficult for John Bow behind him. And my goodness, he's succeeding, whilst driving absolutely fairly. 40 years old, Larry Perkins. He's not one of the younger men in the race, but he certainly makes up for that with his enormous experience. And hats off, too, to his teammate, Thomas Metzera, who has driven a superbly judged race, a very mature race, and I'm wondering in the back of my mind all the time, just a little suspiciously win, whether John Bow at the appropriate moment can reach out and, uh, and on a neck or nothing basis, turn a turbo screw or a turbo control, wind up the boost, risk blowing the engine, but in so doing, close on and perhaps pass Larry Perkins in the very closing stages. Well, as we all know, Murray, you only remember the winner, and obviously that's what the man's trying to do. If he was very, very close to him, I'd be tempted to believe that. I think he's dropped back a little bit too far to, to have that belief at the moment. But if you watch the cars, the amount of adhesion they've still got is incredible. They're able to lift a wheel, and that's all down to the grip the tires are still giving. And when you hear about uh, the gearbox uh, problems with the, uh, with the alternator on the Perkins car, it's interesting to, to wonder what some of this uh, transmission oil is going through at the moment. The Castrol lubrication is certainly being tested to its limit. Holden leads, Ford Sierra, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth. That's the size of the problem that Larry Perkins there is dealing with. He's in the lead in second position. Two seconds or so behind him is John Bow. In third position is the Seaton Bond Sierra. In fourth place is the Brock Medecki Sierra. In fifth position, it is the Longhurst Jones Sierra. And in sixth place, the Drew Price George Fury car. Well, everybody here is absolutely a gog. <laughs> And understandably so. It's been a superb race from the start to the finish with all those incidents. Let us not forget Jim Richards and his control of the race until he had the misfortune to have that wheel come off. Then he fought his way back again. And now Larry Perkins goes into the left-hander and he certainly pulled out a lead now. It's up to four seconds ahead. 4.2 seconds. Larry Perkins shrugging his shoulders and metaphorically laughing it off the opposition is on a final charge because this is lap 123 at Eastern Creek, which must be beside itself with, in, with pleasure at having put on such a superb inaugural race. Look back. No, you only just saw the flash of the Red Sierra in the background and we'll pick up with all the helicopters there, they've brought people in, they'll be taking them out, but no one will be leaving yet a while until this has been resolved. Each lap, 3.93 kilometers. There are two to go at the end of this one, and no change. So, Perkins, John Bow. John, of course, Australian champion in 1985, not only driven for Ford, but for Volvo and Nissan, and like Larry Perkins, a winner at Bathurst, and he's also been a single-seater man, Formula V, Formula Ford, Formula 2, Formula Pacific. He's done it all, and it looks as though he hasn't done quite enough in this race because visually he's even further back. My stopwatch will give you the answer because Larry Perkins now is into his 124th lap and he is still four seconds ahead and that will do very nicely, thank you. This really is a stinger of a finish, isn't it? The car looks so balanced, there's no smoke pouring from it other than something unforeseen 
I would say Larry's sitting pretty at the moment. And he certainly does seem to have pulled out that little gap on Joe, on uh, John Bow, maybe broken the confidence. It's an enormous tribute to Larry Perkins, not only in terms of his skill, but to his car preparation and engine building. He has his own engineering business in Melbourne, and my goodness, immaculate preparation has paid off. A special screamer engine for qualifying, which got him to second place on the grid, gave him an advantage at the start. Their race tactics, that is to say, Perkins and Metzera, have been absolutely immaculate. And Thomas Metzera is uh, going to enter the ranks of the great of Australian touring car champion drivers, I should think, because having won at Bathurst, he's showing signs now of winning this enormously pre prestigious race. I say showing signs because so often in the past, I have made some confident statement only for it to be proved wrong. And that's John Bow. John Bow, Larry Perkins has definitely won the Nissan 500 if he can just keep going for one more lap because John Bow has done there what he did earlier in the race. He has spun off and this time he is not driving back. Well, that is rotten, cruel, bitter luck for John Bow, who is sitting in the car there. He may be trying to start it, but there is no movement. He is absolutely fed up and with justification. Who knows? I'm surprised if it's tyres, because he was on a newer set of tyres than Larry Perkins. Here's the replay, and you can see him sliding that great flash of flame. And, it, well, I'm guessing, when in that case, that the reason John went off was because the engine blew and the transmission locked up. Check. It looks, it looks as if something locked up, Murray. That was too violent a spin to be just a driver mistake. You don't get a flash of fire like that for no reason. And John Bow is too fed up even to get out of the car. Barry Perkins, on the other hand, will be out of the car as though he has a spring attached to his backside when this car, that is finished because he will have won the Nissan 500. He is on his last lap. A lot of people wouldn't have predicted that the Holden V8 would blow off all the Sierras, let alone the Nissan GTR here at Nissan Creek on this, at Nissan Creek, at Eastern Creek on this memorable day. But uh, it looks as though that is going to be the situation. Actually, Murray, there's a great stream of oil across the road there where John Bay went off, so obviously it's a transmission failure. Yes, well, John won't have to blame himself. But now Larry Perkins enters the start and finish straight for the last time, and I'm looking for the chequered flag, and there is the chequered flag. Larry Perkins, Holden Commodore, wins at Eastern Creek the Nissan 500. And what an absolutely magnificent victory by the Melbourne-based Larry Perkins. He was very confident when I talked to him earlier yesterday. He said, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to put the Holden on the front row of the grid, maybe even pole position, Murray, and I'm pretty optimistic about the race. Win, he was so right. Yes, he certainly was. And uh, it proves that our Bathurst win this year wasn't just a fluke. The cars are back. The development this year between Larry Perkins and the Holden Racing Team has really proved at the end of the year. Very, very pleased with it. And you can tell from the disconsolate body language of John Bow that he's bitterly disappointed, as indeed he should be, because right to the end there was a possibility that if it may be, maybe, and I really am guessing, he did turn up the boost, and maybe that caused the trouble. I don't know. He does, and we'll know later on. But meantime, what we do know absolutely for sure is that the Australian Holden has won in Australia at Eastern Creek with Larry Perkins at the wheel. And that, that is a great, great victory. So up into second place then, because we, here he is, finishing in second place. It's the Seaton Bond Sierra. Then another Sierra in third position, that of Peter Brock and Andrew Medecki. In fourth position, the Brabham brothers have done it. In fifth position, the Price Fury Sierra, and then the Tony Longhurst Alan Jones car. It's time to leave Eastern Creek again, but we'll be back. Man of means by no means, king of the road, the boxcar midnight train.
Back live at Eastern Creek, and that is the aftermath of John Bow's uh, race. Terribly disappointing for him. Four seconds behind Perkins in that last lap and couldn't quite bridge the gap, and then the car blows up on him. But that is racing. It's been a wonderful day at Eastern Creek. Uh, Marvellous racing and a big win to Larry Perkins in the Commodore. In the meantime, let's join Darrell Eastlake down there with the winners and uh, all the action that's taking place. But uh, we've still got to wait for the cars to come in. In the meantime, we keep looking at the uh, sorry side, uh, Maxi, of what was probably one of the best races we've seen with John Bauer, just not quite being able to make up the ground. Yeah, it would have been tough for Dick Johnson too to be uh, be back there in the pits and uh, and to watch it. Of course, on the other hand, you you watch the, the contrast of emotions to Larry Perkins. It was a fantastic win from him. And Thomas Matsera, gee, uh, what an impressive drive that was. But between the two of them now, they've picked up the two biggies. They've got Bathurst and that. And... Uh, I suppose the interesting thing for me this afternoon was to have Larry Perkins talk us through the car. Five gallons, uh, five, five miles to the gallon, and to have all the, uh, all the controls in there, the dual points, to look at uh, the inside of a car. It's something that I guess our viewers don't get an opportunity to do very much. Mm. But to me, it's really been a tremendous learning curve right throughout the day. Yeah, and a great debut for the uh, Eastern Creek uh, Raceway for the Tin Tops, they are top touring cars here in Australia. A good crowd out there today, lovely conditions, and a great race. They couldn't have uh, wanted for a better curtain uh, racer for uh, car racing at Eastern Creek. And certainly the drivers have come away, and they have said that this is a fine track. All the sweeping curves, you get all the skills on display there. John Bauer walking back to the pits, terribly disappointing for him. In the meantime, let's join Darrell Eastlake down in the presentation area. We've waited a long time here for Eastern Creek in New South Wales, and boy, oh boy, wasn't the wait worth uh, waiting for. What a ripper race this afternoon, no doubt about that. I'm unashamedly an Australian, and I can't tell you how happy I am to see a Commodore get up. But <laughs> Nissan paid the money this afternoon. They put the money up for it. Unfortunately, their car didn't run as well as they thought. Showed so much pace, but once again, it was a little unreliable, but they'll get that fixed for next season. With us, of course, the man who put up with that money, Mr. Ivan Deverson, the managing director of Nissan Australia, would like to just say a few words on for the first time that we've seen the big cars go around in anger here at Eastern Creek. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ivan Deverson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Houston, Mr. Roland Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Nissan Australia. The winner of the 1990 Touring Car Championship is particularly proud to have sponsored this inaugural event here at Eastern Creek today, the Nissan 500. We would like to particularly congratulate the New South Wales Government on bringing us this magnificent course of international standards and I know we can look forward to great motor racing here in the future. I'll now ask Mr Roland Smith to assist me in presenting the prizes to the popular winners of the Nissan 500. Thank you, Ivan. Well, he was really confident in pit lane yesterday. He had a, a bit of bad luck at Bathurst, but he's made up for that with the last race of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, the man himself, Larry Perkins, co-driver Thomas Mazzera. Larry, very quickly. <laughs> Thanks very much, fellas. This is, this is certainly a time to uh, thank everyone, and uh, I thank my team. But team, first and foremost, they did an absolutely excellent job. Of course, my other driver, Thomas, we, all, we kept it on the island and we had to run to the wire. But I do thank the, uh, the shareholders of Eastern Creek and the uh, New South Wales government for having some vision to get this world-class circuit on the map and for Nissan for picking up the uh, race here. I think it's absolutely excellent. And lastly, but not least, uh, my three sponsors, Castrol, Dunlop and the Holden Motor Company. None of them claim to be a major sponsor, but I tell you, to me, they're extremely major. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice guy, Larry Perkins, see? Yeah? The nice guys do come first every now and again, and uh, that was a terrific result and a great race at Eastern Creek for the Tin Tops.
Yeah, you can always pick a winner, can't you? You can see the grin from here to here. I don't think he's going to have too many problems, though, in uh, in, in filling the, the, the car door with a new sponsor, though. I mean, he's had a really big double this year. It's been fantastic. And we, we saw some terrific racing, some some terrific action. I mean, Brocky came off early. Then then you look at Jim Richards. Uh, he went out like a beauty to start with and come back, regained the... Uh, uh, the race lead after losing a wheel and uh, of course that's what racing's all about you have a winner you have a loser good luck bad luck well mate we are uh, approaching the checkered flag we've had a great year in 1990 for the wide world of sports this is our last show for the year of course you've got your show tomorrow with uh, louis and then sports sunday tomorrow afternoon and then the big cricket season but uh, i'd like to thank you big fella because it's been a beauty yeah, it's been great we started off on new rubber we're finishing up on a little bit of old rubber we'll take the new ball next week in hobart <laughs> good on you son and all the best for 1991 yeah and we hope you've enjoyed this final edition for 1990 and uh, like you, I'd uh, wish you a very, very happy holiday and put your feet up. Have a good uh, season in the summer with our uh, cricket coming up. In the meantime, good afternoon. Oh, heavens above. Kerry, you have done it again. I don't believe it. The car cut in half. Nineteen ninety, Nine's Wide World of Sports, still the one.